Okay, so you're very welcome to today's meeting of the Executive Office Committee. Uh, thank you to members for their attendance. The meeting is now currently uh, being broadcast live through the web page. Uh, and also, uh, if I could just remind members to make sure that they are muted whenever they're not speaking and to use the hand feature along uh, the top of your uh, page, which will indicate to me that you're looking to speak. And also, just to, after you finish speaking, if you can drop that down so that I can keep an eye out for it again. Um, if I could ask the clerk if we have received any apologies for the meeting today. Okay, <laughs> you're furiously sending me a message to say none for the full meeting anyway. So thank you for that. Uh, in terms of chairman's business, I think. Um, Maybe just it's important to note that uh, I would welcome, as I'm sure other members would, the uh, court ruling that the executive office now must move and make the payments for the victim's pension. The sector has obviously waited uh, for too long. Uh, many were caught up in matters that weren't of their cause and has resulted them uh, in having a lifetime of pain, suffering and problems. Now, the payment and the pension will certainly enable uh, some closure to be brought to these individuals and enable some help and assistance to be given to them as well. Uh, I think we've all said on many occasions that we feel that they've waited too long and that they've been let, let down by the entire political establishment. Um, it has been particularly, though, uh, unedifying to see the British Secretary of State hide and refuse to meet the executive to discuss the finances of this matter. Uh, and I certainly hope that this court ruling will bring uh, a certain swiftness to his role and work uh, and uh, see a, a meeting with the executive taking place. And I think to uh, would urge uh, our executive and uh, the finance minister to urgently review the court decision and ensure that there is a budget line established so that these payments can commence as soon as possible because those people, there, there should just be no further delays. Uh, and I think we have certainly uh, rehearsed that, that argument on a number of occasions here to try and urge that forward. Um, moving on then to item three, draft minutes. Uh, the draft minutes are being held on the 3rd of February or at page seven of the meeting pack. Are members content that there are true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting? Okay, so with no dissent, we'll take that that's fine and we'll get those signed off then. Uh, in terms of matters arising, just members, there was a memo was sent to the Clerk of the Committee for the Economy in relation to the use of unspent monies intended for the High Street Voucher Scheme uh, for other purposes. Uh, the Committee for the Economy has been engaged on this subject. 95 million was ring-fenced for the voucher scheme, but was returned because it couldn't be spent. The Department for the Economy has made a bid for 140 million for the year 21-22 for a voucher scheme and for other COVID-related initiatives. And the Committee for the Economy has agreed to forward any further developments uh, in that area to us here at this committee. So that's by way of an update there for members. Um, going to move uh, next to then item five, which is to invite in members from the Joint Committee of the Implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, we are certainly expecting uh, a fairly large membership of that committee. So we'll just give a wee moment to get everybody uh, brought online. Okay, I understand that the chair is having a few difficulties just getting uh, switched on to that. So we'll maybe just give another few moments for uh, Fergus to try uh, or retry to get back on again. I think I can hear him, but I can't quite see him. Um, I will just... Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Going to potentially just pick on my colleague, if that's possible, Claire, because you're simply on the screen in front of me because <laughs> your microphone is, is switched on, so that's brought you up into the spotlight. Do you have, does the committee have a, a deputy chair? I, I just don't understand that, that Fergus is having difficulty uh, getting uh, logged in, or if maybe one of the other members is the, the vice chair, if they maybe want to use the hand up feature just to indicate to me that that you are the vice chair, and I maybe go ahead, Claire. Chair, chair, I'm not, but that'll teach me to have my camera on uh, during a meeting. And, and I think we're all, if you haven't used this technology, I, it, it, I'm struggling. I'm in a, a cupboard trying to use it, so f forgive me. Um, I don't know if we have a have a have a, a vice chair. And to be honest, um, our papers haven't outlined the procedural, um, uh, you know, the the kind of ways of working. But um, I'm sure we're all content to kind of wing it if if um if that's what it is required okay. Colin, if I, can in, um, oh. I think a Hello, number Michelle. of our members are having to Colin, if, um i think a number of our members are having a wee bit of difficulty getting connected um okay i did download the app so i'm in all right but um i can't um i can't see if fergus is in yet I, I've got a good, there's a list uh, that you can use for down the side of the page, so I can see at the moment that we have from yourselves, we've got Brenton Smith, uh, John Finucane, Paul Maskey, uh, Jennifer Carl McNeil, Stephen Farry, Michelle, yourself, Claire, oh, Chris damn. Hazard, Niall Blaney, then Orla, oh, oh, Orla Begley. Orla Begley, Chair, uh, mm -hmm. I would say that that at least offers, as, as from my quick assessment, a cross party, um, a, a, you know, uh, a, a, a member from most uh, parties that are represented in our committee. If 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 okay. that gives you enough um, confidence to proceed. Okay. Um, I'm just waiting on confirmation from the text from uh, we're checking if there is somebody that can be identified as Paul Paul Steve the clerk of our committee is in Paul are you physically are you in the or um... hi everybody Fergus yeah. is now Fergus is in he's arrived now so he has so I'm hoping we'll get him on the screen now in a second. Can I just recommend to everybody as well with this system, if you can uh, mute yourself because any movement that you make uh, in your office, even a cough is enough for the microphone to pick you up and bring you up into the spotlight. So um, if you sort of run your mouse over the screen, you'll get the, the option to be able just to to mute yourself and it means then that we can and we'll get uh, Fergus sorted now. While Fergus is uh, um, getting sorted out, it's great to see you. This is my first assembly meeting since 2017, after having been uh, been in the assembly since 1998, so it's a bit bizarre to be back in the in, in an assembly meeting, albeit online. Um, yeah. So I wonder, have we, Fergus? I, I, I do I do think for it too. This uh, this meeting is very important. So if you can uh, give us a wee bit more time to discuss those very uh, crucial issues that'd be great as well if, if that's yeah. if that's possible well i think the the, the 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 potential next move michelle might get me to get you to sing a song for us just to try and kill the, the dead air for the next five minutes uh because i think fergus is in again <laughs> and um is back with us but he could drop colin, out again better telling jokes colin <laughs> okay do we get back on board at this stage <laughs> Start with stand-up routine here. <laughs> okay. Right, I'm going to go for Plan B, which I think you said was um, Paul Stevens. Oh, are you the? 
Are you the clerk committee there? Paul, are you there? No, okay. So, um, and I think <laughs> Michelle has frozen on us as well, I think, uh, unfortunately, which I think may be a, a, a rural broadband issue more than, than, than any other issue. I okay. thought you were going to call um, it a blessing in disguise there, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm being very careful today, Emma, as my role is chairman. Uh, okay, the very top person on my list is Brenton Smith. Brenton, are you there? Yes, Colin. Can you hear me, Colin? Okay, Brenton. I can indeed, yes. Uh, just two things. Number one, your, I think your camera is currently looking at your phone. If you were able to swivel that one back around, there, there may be, I hope, a, not a, a, a little putty cap as other meetings have had, but if we can get that round uh, to yourself. Because you're just literally the top one on my list, could I ask, please, would you mind sharing from your side until we get Fergus sorted out? And the system yeah. I used is basically you're the very top one of my list, if that would be acceptable to everybody. It was James Lawless is our vice chair. He's not on the line, Colin, is he? James Lawless, no. No, he's not. No. No, I'll go, ahead, I'll go ahead until Fer Fergus gets online. So, Colin, sure. Okay, we'll do that, and and at least we'll get ourselves into a starting mode, folks. Thank you very much indeed uh, for coming along today. Um, albeit the technology is wonderful when it works, but as we can see, not so good whenever it doesn't. But we will endeavour anyway. Uh, the topic that we need to discuss is very important and we shall endeavour to work our way through uh, all of the technical uh, backgrounds. Um, just to be able to say that the easiest way that, that we've certainly found from these engagements is that um, if there are members of our committee that want to ask a question, I, I'll get them to ask the question to me and I will send it then to Brenton that's chairing and then Brenton can filter it out. Uh, for people to answer, just to make sure that everybody gets a fair go at it and that there's an equal spread uh, for people that wish to answer. So for those that are from the Joint Committee, um, if you want to, in whatever way, make it known to Brenton that you'd like to speak or Fergus whenever he arrives, and then we'll just filter through the two chairs for that matter. Um, before we do progress, um, and maybe Brenton might give us a few words just about the background of, of, of your work so far, and that kind of puts them on the spot a bit. But um, I do think that uh, I, I need to say that we have been informed that the members of the DUP of this committee are not attending this segment of the meeting. And I do have to say that I find that disappointing. Uh, there are many businesses and many groups who will be impacted by the rollout of the protocol in its early days. And I feel that if you're not prepared to be part of um, the solution, then you stand accused of being part of the problem. Uh, so if you aren't attending uh, this also, but you are attending the next segment, it does leave us in the scenario. We are actually watching the meeting somewhere, but you're not coming down to participate in it. And I think that that is both equally unhelpful and just quite sad. So um, mm -hmm. I'm going to move on with the committee that we can have uh, our conversations in solution finding mode. Uh, and what I would do is I would ask Brenton, um, if you want to give us, if you wouldn't mind, just a few words about what your committee has been doing, uh, what work you've been doing in the background, what the priorities have been, uh, and then we can maybe open up to questions after that. Um, thanks very much, Colin, and I very much welcome this engagement between the Good Friday Committee and the Executive Committee. I think it's very important, and hopefully in the not-too-distant future, we'll be able to meet in person. I just recall that one of the best meetings I attended over the four years where we all discussed Brexit was a meeting of the North-South Interparliamentary Association back in 2015 in Stormont. I think you would have been present yourself, Colin, at that meeting, where we had a great, robust discussion, good, good views, diverse views expressed at that time. But I think it's very important that we have maximum cooperation and dialogue between Stormont and between the Oireachtas. As, as your members will know, the Good Friday Committee with us is quite unique 
in that we have members, MPs elected in Northern Ireland are all entitled to participate and are members of our committee. Now, um, during the past few months and with restrictions on meetings, we wouldn't have had as much work um, succeed in carrying out as much work as we would like. Obviously, Brexit, the All-Ireland economy, dealing with legacy issues, they're all priority issues within our work programme. So um, we have been discussing those, having been a member of the committee in previous um, parliamentary sessions, I always found that our visits to Northern Ireland to meet different groups from all political traditions and meeting business community, representative organisations, different advocacy groups in the border area as well, we found that work to be most beneficial for all of us. And again, we would hope to be able to resume that work as long as when the COVID restrictions are are lifted, and hopefully that will be possible by the middle of the year. Naturally, the All Ireland Economy, North South cooperation, building on the progress that has been achieved for all of our island. That's the main body of work that we that we engage with, and we have we have over the years been able to give a platform to groups that may that may have felt. Um, th that they hadn't enough participation in contributing to decision making in the past. So again, we would hope to be able to to invite different groups um, from all traditions to our committee in the future as well to listen to those voices at first hand, apart from the political voices. But again, I welcome this opportunity to have this dialogue, and I hope that we can have a regular meeting on issues that have common concern to us. We have all common concerns, whether it's my constituents in Cavan Monaghan or any of your constituencies north of the border as well. So we have so many common issues that we need to address on, 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 a, on an all-Ireland basis as well and working in harmony with one another. So thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much for that, Brenton, uh, and I appreciate you stepping up into to the role of chairing us. Uh, I, I do thank you for that. Um, maybe if I could begin by uh, asking a couple of questions and then have a number of members. Uh, and if, if we ask the question, uh, we'll pass it over to yourself and then your, your committee members could then uh, give a response. Um, if we'll maybe start. Um, we, we have received a good number of presentations from our Equality and Human Rights Commissions and also from the Dublin-based Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. And we have heard from them the issues that they see in terms of citizens' rights as a result of Brexit. But what would be your understanding of the main issues that need to be monitored and assessed? And, and what work have you been doing uh, to try and keep an eye on that and monitor it? Just uh, in regard to specific issues, often it's our own sectoral committees within the Iraq that will deal with specific issues, you know, be it trade, be it business, be it justice matters. Now, our role is is we don't have a legislative role, so if there was a need for legislation to be initiated, it would be one of our sectoral committees would deal with with specific issues. Now, to date, to my knowledge, unless it's in our correspondence or requests for meetings, there haven't been any specific um, issues brought to our attention that we need to address, say, on a legislative or regulation basis here. There, there will be teething problems, as we all know, and issues will arise. One of the issues that, that have been raised at previous meetings of our committee since early January have been the trade issues, the difficulties at the ports, and some of the, the, the difficulties in the whole... Um, business chain and the whole supply chain those are the type of issues that that have come by and large to us it has been to my knowledge the ones that have been brought to my attention both by constituents of my own and by people saying for man and arma as well would have been really on the basis of delays at ports um colin if i if i could come in there just um as well uh, I think this is a great forum for us today, and unfortunately, um, all the parties aren't represented, and, and that's a pity because I think we have unprecedented challenges on the island of Ireland as a result of Brexit. And, um, you know, the fact that people in the North didn't vote for Brexit, didn't ask for this to be imposed upon us is is very is very difficult for, for all of us, and especially those of us in rural constituencies and border constituencies, but in terms of that ports issue and the and the rights, Chris Hazard 
um, would be um, would be very across these issues, Colin, um, if you would let him in to, to discuss some of the challenges that we face as a result of Brexit and what it's doing to trade on the island and to the All-Ireland agri-food uh, and manufacturing supply chains. Okay, okay. Uh, Chris, do you want to come in there? Thanks to Michelle for throwing me into it. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, look, I'm here, Gordon Ogget, um, Colin, uh, and, and the committee. It's good to be here. It's good as a, a fellow South Down constituent and colleague um, to be on an All Ireland meeting such as this. So, um, fair play, it's a, it's a good initiative. Um, no, look, I just wanted to add to what Brendan maybe said around. You know, there's obviously concerns when you look at the business, the whole spectrum of issues with regard to what's happening. But I suppose in the specifics around rights, you know, we'll have to look at the minute. There's big, big uncertainty around um, the frontier workers and the rights of workers going forward. You know, uh, the labor, all Ireland labor market has been really crucial to the development um, of business across the island, but also of um, the cohesion of border communities and. Um, and, and just wider life on the island. But I think particularly on this point um, around the democratic rights and rights of representation, and we've seen this only last week through the the, you know, the foolish mistake of the European Commission uh, around Article 16, and that that missing element of you know a mechanism or checks and balances for the North and for the, the certainly for the Assembly to have a voice uh, and a forum in Europe uh, and to be represented there, um, so I know it's, it's something certainly that we have raised directly with the Office of Antichok. Um, I know it's something that we have also raised with EU colleagues in the Parliament and in the Commission and the various groups. Yeah, and I think it's actually something that m m maybe coming out of today jointly is, you know, the, the Committee and the Assembly and the, and the Committee, obviously, in the Arctis, the, that we do write um, to the EU Commission, that we do write to the EU Parliament and indeed the, the presidents of the groups uh, in Europe to say, it's really important we find a mechanism and that we utilise any mechanisms we can to give people in the north a voice and give businesses, very importantly, a voice. One of the big problems over the last number of weeks is, to a large extent, the European Union expects interests and issues here from the north to be to be raised via London. And we know that's simply not practical for a number of reasons. Uh, and it's crucial to give people a voice um, and, and to use them mechanisms. We know they've been created, for example. We know, obviously, the work around the Joint Committee and the, the Consultative Committees that's to come. We know we have a, a civic forum uh, and a, a parliamentary partnership forum to come down the line too. So I think it'll be good to, to scope out what's that going to look like, you know, how can we all play a role in that um, and start to address some of those, you know, deficits and rights that, you know, has been alluded to so far. Chair, if I could... Thank you, Chris. Claire, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just come and thank thank you very much, and well done on the continuity. You have a great future as a game show host if the politics doesn't work out there. I think in the given the show on the road, and I would also like to say that I regret that there, there are those in the DUP who are not. I mean, it's twenty twenty one. If people um, can't participate in a video conference about uh, you know the pressing political and practical and economic um, uh, issue no, no. of of our time, um, I, I suppose that the trade and movement. Um, and the issues at the at the port and supplies are the most tangible aspects at the moment, and therefore it's right that we're all uh, focusing on them very much. And I will say that the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee um, through Westminster, which I suppose is a companion uh, committee to, to this one and to yours, is uh, conducting a rolling inquiry essentially into those frictions and how they can be mitigated. And for example, had the hauliers and the port authorities in this morning to give a very direct, no spin, no flim flam uh, account of, of um, you know, the logistics as they're finding it and to ensure that those experiences and, and a lot of the other kind of practical content we're getting out of business organisations can be fed in directly to the EU, to the UK, to the executive um, and to these structures that need to be kind of processing um, the issues, and uh, and in terms of the of the the, the rights uh, and and other, I suppose, of the slightly less tangible issues, we're looking into citizenship and cross border border security and other inquiries, and some of those issues have been picked up directly by Dublin. Things like 
EHIC and Erasmus and, and some of those access issues, which is which is good. But I think this committee, in terms of the joint implementation of the Good Friday Committee, uh, a Good Friday Agreement, will need to have a close watch on just borderism, really, and I suppose creeping um, creeping frictions between uh, North South operation and the proper uh, North South operation that that to be honest have have haven't all been used that well in the last few years, but that certainly may start to creep in because of how thin uh, the protocol uh, is in in terms of its area of coverage. Colin, can I give any indicator there, Colin? Um, say that to me again, Brendan. Senator Niall Blaney indicated, I think, Colin, he wanted to contribute. Yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, Niall, do you want to go on ahead there? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, co-chairs. Um, first and foremost, like others, uh, really welcome the whole engagement today. Um, the the North-South approach um, is really, really encouraging. But like others, I'm disappointed that the DEP, or the DEP have uh, decided not to partake. Um, it's disappointing. Um, I think at the end of the day, all um, those partaking here today wish to, I suppose, communicate our issues and problems on the ground uh, with a view to resolve them for all our people, uh, either side of the border. And that's certainly the logic we're taking to these meetings uh, to ensure that our economies prosper and our people uh, within that, those economies prosper also. Um, I'm not sure, Colin, if you have a platform or otherwise to uh, maybe engage with the DUP and maybe to ask a simple question as maybe to um, what's the obstacles for them taking part in today's engagement. Uh, I, I know for one, as a former co-chair, I worked very hard on, on the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly over nearly a two-year period some years ago to get them involved um, within that uh, assembly. And it took some work, but we eventually got engagement. And I think that um, if there are issues there, let's have them and let's see if we can, if we can um, discuss them and see if we can figure them out uh, and try and move things on. Um, as Brent rightly said there, we're, we're not a... A breakfast committee per se. The the the, the houses here do have a, a breakfast committee, um, but what we very very much are as a, a committee that's looking to, to move on the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, and, and moreover, um, have some discussion uh, on our side basis on how best we move forward on a shared island basis. And um, I'm particularly interested in hearing um, members' views on that. Uh, and I suppose we, when we have a number of MPs or MLAs um, already on our committee uh, from Stormont, uh, more generally, in your committee, I'd like to hear their views uh, on a shared island, um, what, what their feeling is about the proposed shared island. Uh, unit that's, that's currently been proposed by the Taoiseach and the conversations and engagement that's currently starting to kick off. Next call. Okay. Could I maybe Thank come in you. on the citizenship stuff? It's now done on you here, Colin. Yeah, go on ahead now. Yeah, thanks. Go on ahead. Thanks, Church. Uh, Colin, listen, just in relation to your, your initial question around the citizenship stuff, I, I think it's really important to remember that while Brenton and Nal are correct around the remit of, of this committee, we are an oversight committee around the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, and it was the agreement that, that set in a legal uh, context the right to identify and be accepted as Irish, as British, or both. Um, and we saw some of the problems uh, around the failure to codify in domestic British law uh, that aspect of the agreement uh, around the D'Souza case. So if we look at the uh, Good Friday Agreement, we had got uh, some initial work done. We had met with 
Ahmed D'Souza privately and, and Department Mandela officials around some of this, but between elections and pandemics, we weren't able to to, to, to carry that, that out further. So that's certainly something I think it's important that this committee, uh, in terms of the Oireachtas Committee, comes back to, but also in terms of not just a Good Friday Agreement, also in particular in terms of Article 2 uh, of the Constitution, um, which uh, codifies in uh, the law in the South, the right of everyone uh, in uh, the uh, entirety of the island born here um, to be Irish citizens. So I I do wonder, Colin, if there is a particular piece of work uh, for both committees to look at those specific issues around citizenship and how we actually get beyond the kind of more notional, aspirational issues of citizenship um, into the more mechanical uh, issues of what that actually means. So what it means for the people that you represent in South Down who are Irish citizens, but beyond the holding of a passport, as Claire rightly said, now we have uh, EHIC and uh, Erasmus, but there's much more we've lost. And there's a lot more in addition to that that we don't have that people live in, uh, in Louth uh, uh, have. So I do think there is a specific piece of work, uh, certainly that our joint Oireachtas committee would do, but I think it would only bolster and help inform our work if we could perhaps take that on. And I know that it's becoming an increasing issue, certainly, and I don't presume to speak uh, on behalf of, of the unionist community, but I know as more people avail of Irish passports, that they want to know what that actually means in practical terms. I know some unions politicians in the past have expressed concerns about a kind of reciprocal arrangement around maybe people born in the 26 counties who want to avail of a British passport and how they they might go about that. So um, I don't really have it uh, in terms of what the actual definitive piece of work might be, but I just sense that that, that, that there is, there's real potential there for us to uh, look at the aspect of the Good Friday Agreement and, and our, resp- uh, our responsibility to be implemented. But there's also, in particular, the issue of who and what the Irish government are doing. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. I'll just try it again. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sure. Uh, I am in. Chair B is open and Chair A is secured. I'm not sure which one I'm in. I think maybe we'll go to Stephen if you wanted to come in there. If you yes. just talk loudly, we'll get to you. We need Jackie that's, Weaver on this call. No, that's it. Sure uh, that's that's right. Right. And, uh, yeah, no, it doesn't matter. Like, we can do no more. Assembly, okay, that's we need to get your help. I'll make sure okay. the next time. No uh, uh, I just wanted to build a bit more. Right, okay, and thank you very much. I think there's a variety of things that we've talked about during the Ministers of Justice. Either last year or the year before, we set out nine different types of um, uh, per- person citizen, um, are, uh, in terms of the, of the legal interaction with the European Union and, uh, and on these islands uh, as a consequence of Brexit. So it's been useful to go back to that and sort of map some of those is- issues out. Um, there are some very particular concerns that are still alive there. I mean, one of those I'm sort of been uh, trying to highlight is whether the memorandum of understanding around the common travel area is robust enough. We have a sense where people actually have a, a hierarchy where those who went through the EU settlement scheme, technically speaking, are on a, a more solid legal position than some, some aspects of the common uh, travel area. There's also um, issues in terms of just differential rights in particular for people who may well be of an Irish um, identity and uh, with ongoing EU citizenship versus those of a British identity in in Northern Ireland. Uh, there's also uh, uh, issues around those with um, who are uh, EU citizens in both jurisdictions on the island and their rights going forward as well. Um, beyond the, the point was made by by Chris around frontier workers, and um, there's also issues around sort of the service economy and freedom of movement as well that we just need to be very conscious of. In, in, in the context of the of the of the island, so I think uh, CAJ, I, I think, have been uh, most of the forefront in terms of mapping out the issues in terms of some sort of work plan. But I think there, there are a whole range of genuine things that are, are worthy of being picked up uh, by both of our committees over the, the coming months. Thanks. Okay, uh, f- thank you for that, Stephen. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, Actually, that, that person that was on the phone call was actually Fergus ringing in, but unfortunately he's had to be removed again because uh, of, of the way that he was uh, talking. So we're going to keep going with Brenton there uh, in the chair. I'll move on to a second question. 
and then we'll move around maybe just for one question uh, from each of the other members because we're at, at 340 and, and, and we're only getting this far so um maybe look just to ask yourselves about the you, you know the, the north south ministerial council is a key component of the good friday agreement and it's in place for the issue you know it, it is a place for issues and concerns uh, as a result uh, of brexit and the protocol to be raised and then escalated to the specialized committee uh, and joint committees by by either or both sides but how do you feel that that's going to work in practice specifically in the northern end where if there are issues that are being addressed that's going to require sign off fundamentally from both sides before it progresses across or will issues go via Dublin through the EU routes but just what do people have uh, any sense of how they think that, that that issues that could be raised through the ministerial council could be a vehicle for helping to find and raise issues in the future <laughs> Yeah, well, Colin, I think the North South ministerial structure, it's very, very important. And I think it was a miss when Stormont, when the executive and the assembly weren't in meeting and when they weren't in, when they had been prorogued. But, um, you know, Michelle and myself would have been colleagues on the North South ministerial council in the past on the agriculture and fishery side. And I think a huge amount of of work that never reaches the public domain is done in the background preparing for the North South Ministerial Councils at official level. I suppose agriculture was one of the areas where there was a lot of North South um, cooperation going on even in advance of the Good Friday Agreement but that was given extra momentum and impetus with the, with the Good Friday Agreement and I, I think we need far more attention and activity on the North South Ministerial Council because it, we know that the ministerial meetings oftentimes the the statements are drafted in advance and oftentimes the, the meetings at political level are signing off on what has on the agreements that have been reached at official level. So I think the, the and government. I'm not aware from government of, of what if there's a need for for new procedures or a new way of doing business. But the basic business of operating and cooperating together, um, north, south, and on all Ireland bases and east, west as well. All of that's extremely important. There's so much working on on a daily basis that doesn't hit the political doesn't get any political attention and that's important that that work continues in that format and that we have regular political meet meetings at ministerial level because that gives the momentum to that work as well so in, in in the different challenges that we will have following brexit i think the role of the ministerial council should 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 be on a higher level than ever in the past and I, and I would sincerely hope that the executive and and our our government here that they will continue to work the ministerial council even to greater effect than it worked in the past okay Brent, do you want to pick maybe one or two other members just to come in on that one to, to answer and then we'll move on to some other questions from yeah I, I can't see with the way my structure set up who of my colleagues are here I, I don't, Neil Blaney's the only person I, I can see. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Jennifer. Yeah, well, Jennifer, go ahead, so please. Sure. Thanks, Brendan. Um, and thanks, and, and thanks everybody for 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 this meeting. Uh, it's it's a privilege to be here with at this meeting. Uh, and may I join all my colleagues in my regret that the DUP haven't joined us. Um, I'm a member of this committee so that I can build friendships, and so that I can build uh, alliances, and so that I can develop my own understanding, my and respect, and so that we can develop that mutual respect and understanding, uh, living on a shared island together. And it's 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 genuinely personally saddening that uh, that that they don't participate in um, in the Oireachtas committee. I you know that that's one thing, but not to participate today is is another step, and uh, I'm genuinely saddened by that today. Nevertheless, there's still work to get on with. Uh, and if I could just back up to Brendan on what he said there about the North South ministerial. Um, uh, role and I recall working in the Department of Housing um, as an official, not as an elected person, but as an official, uh, a period ago when the when when the Parliament instalment was prorogued, and how difficult that made just practical matters, matters that never really need to become political matters. Now, remember, you know, administrative matters, technical matters, and how those were disrupted in uh, waters, in utility, in uh, the, the management of, of, of those different issues, as, as was relevant to the Department of Housing at the time. Um, and, and I, I hope, obviously, that that, that, that that wouldn't ever happen again, but it does show how crucial 
that alliance and, and how crucial that political structure is and that it that it functions and operates. And so, um, uh, you know, I don't have insight now as to as to how that's operating on a, on, on a day to day basis. You know, not being in government, not being in the, the relevant departments. Um, but you know, we've a clear a clear need for that to work effectively uh, on behalf of everybody on this island in a practical way. Uh, and that has been shown to be more the case rather than less the case in the intervening period. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to contribute to the meeting. Time, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, please. Yeah, Colin, ahead, Chris. Yes, Colin, I don't know if you can. It's just, um, yeah, and it goes back to maybe something Jennifer said there. And I, I think, yes, the, the NSMC, of course, it's really important, but it's also really important that this conversation flows out into civic society. You know, we know that border communities, for example, are going to be at the coal face of much of the problems. They need to have a forum, they need to have a space. Um, you know, and, and even wider than the NSMC, there needs to be an appetite for this. I think it's been scandalous that the Dublin government have been so lethargic in sharing passenger data, for example, when it comes to COVID. Um, I, I think that Antisha and his, and his cabinet should be rightfully shameful. Um, I, I think it, it really has been a shameful episode. Um, and I, so it's, it's about wanting to work that those mechanisms that are in place are there for a reason. Um, and I think too too often um, it's a box that sometimes is ticked, and they don't realise the real importance, especially in wider civic society. Um, you know, we we did a meeting there recently with IBEC uh, and CBI, Intertrade Ireland. They're doing a huge amount of work now to scope out what are the opportunities of the protocol. Um, you know, what type of things can local communities um, can you know local voluntary and community sector local businesses all take out of the likes of the protocol. What's the new trading environment going to be? Um, and there's a huge amount of work being done. And I think now North and South, both the executive um, and, and the cabinet in the South, need to lift these issues because ordinary people um, working in these jobs, these frontier workers, etc., they all expect that type of leadership. And, and I think they now need to get on board. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, there was another voice, I think, trying to come in there just as well at the same time. Was there somebody else looking in on that? Colin, that was me. It's uh, Emer Curry here. Emer, yes, go on ahead, Emer. Who are you? Look, I'm one of those people. I, I struggled to get into the conversation, and now I'm playing catch up. But um, I just thank you so much for organising this, and I hope that there are going to be more. Um, and I, yes, I know that the the DUP aren't here, and that is disappointing. But at the same time, there's so much work. Even you know, having this conversation, we might. We'll be picking up ideas to to come back to in our in our work plan, and um, to cover, and uh, like one of the things that that I'm keen um, to do is that there is a voice for community organisations and you know people on the ground and grassroots that they can come to our, our committee and bring those insights and and especially around things like you know the effect of the the effect of the legacy issues and um you know social deprivation and we've had some really good um contributions about education um and research and um you know the more of that there's so much work to do it's it, it's actually um it's hard to decide where 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 you want to go but i uh, look to to echo the importance of the north south ministerial council and also in in, in the context of, of of health and in covid um you know the, i think we've really seen the effect of the um of the not having um, the the executive um, for those few years and uh, not having more initiatives coming on board, um, and and I think I, I think we really do have to put um, an emphasis on getting getting initiatives um, working together up and running um, and getting behind the the engagement um, of the North South Ministerial Council. And the house. Okay. Sorry, thank, you for that. thank you thank you for that for the and um, for those other answers people thank, thank you I'm, go, I'm going to move on uh, i'm going to ask uh the deputy chair doug Beatty to come on board and i'm just going to ask my members if they can get everything that they want to ask condensed down into one input please because we're we're really up against it in terms of time but i'll pass over to doug to ask a question there 
Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you, uh, deputies and senators and MPs and, and everybody else. There's a, there's a queer mix of people um, here. Uh, as the sole unionist, I feel like my back's against the wall a little bit. Um, but um, that's the, the, the way we are at this moment in time. I know there's a lot of focus been put on the DUP not being here, um, uh, and that's their decision. I, I am here. But I would just say to you all, if I can, please, to understand something. Um, there are frictions and there are instabilities at this moment in time, um, and we cannot just bat them away and ignore them. We are going to have to address them, uh, and they need uh, addressing because uh, if this continues, we could see the unravelling uh, of an awful lot of good work that's been done over many years by a lot of really uh, good people. But I've been asked to condense everything down to one question, and I, uh, I certainly will um, if I can, please. But um, in Northern Ireland, we have a fine balance uh, where both communities ha have a balance as to how we go about our daily lives. And we worry about that balance uh, continually. Um, and right now, um, if we had to put up a hard border on the island of Ireland, uh, that balance would have been upset. We have put a border in the Irish Sea and that balance uh, has been upset. Uh, and that will affect north-south cooperation, uh, and I think it will uh, affect the north-south ministerial council. And, and again, I will say this, and I will plead with us all, is that we cannot ignore that because that's where we are now. And whether it's an identity issue, um, as some pointed out uh, before, and I know Stephen pointed this out in, in 2019, I believe, uh, Stephen Farry, and I, and I absolutely agree with him, but if we don't address it, um, then things are going to go in the wrong in the wrong direction. So let me just ask a very simple question. Um, uh, Lord Trimble, uh, Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize recipient, uh, co-author and negotiator uh, of the Good Friday or the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, said, "The astonishing and disturbing fact is that the withdrawal agreement, and in particular the protocol, clearly rips apart the Good Friday Agreement." How do you answer that? when somebody like Lord Trimble is saying it. Chair. Go ahead, Chair. Happy to come in. And firstly, thank you, Doug, for engaging, as you always do, uh, in, in, I think, in, in good faith, because there are undoubtedly problems to solve, and I don't disagree for a second that there, uh, this place is a delicately balanced uh, place and that equilibrium has certainly been upset by Brexit and I'm not going to go into and I know um, you wouldn't dispute you know the sad series of events and missed opportunities that have taken us to this uh, point and I don't think anybody and I, nobody should minimise the sense of injury that some people feel in terms of the constitutional uh, outlook that, uh, that a barrier in the Irish Sea has caused to people. I suppose the point is and we can um, we do need to work through that and I suppose find ways uh, and I suppose understand what, what reassurances people want. But the only way that we can um, address it is by being clear that these are practical issues, that it wasn't a case that the EU or the UK government or anybody else decided to flip a coin and you know what, we're going to go with the nationalists on this one. As always, we have been dealing with a set of practicalities and the reality is that uh, though, though I think the constitutional feeling for people would feel the same, the, the realities of friction in the Irish Sea are considerably more manageable than frictions on, on land and, and in terms of business flow and the flow of people. And I don't think that's in any dispute. And I don't say that to minimise um, the fact that people feel that they, are, they have diverged or are different from the UK, albeit Northern Ireland has always had substantial divergences. But I think the way that we manage um, the, the emotional injury that people are feeling is by being honest with them that it wasn't you know, a political va value that you lost or a political battle that you lost due to the bad faith of the EU, but just being honest about the realities of the movement of goods and people uh, and, and regulations. And that is why we are seeking to address the most um, the most disruptive of those. For example, you know, if it is people uh, travelling with a pet, or if it is, you know, the sense that businesses who've long since traded across the Irish Sea are prevented from doing so. It's it's about working through the things that 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 are most practically disruptive in people's everyday life because those things are practically disruptive. But absolutely, so would be um, a hard border with with some attempt to manage three hundred uh, crossings. And I suppose again, it's about being honest with people that 
there just weren't any options left due to the poor choices, the poor political choices of, of other people. And it wasn't, um, you know, just a, a, a political choice that was designed to disfavor unionism. It, it, it's, it's dealing with practicalities and realities and working together to take um, the, the most damaging everyday uh, issues off the table. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Brendan, do you want to yeah, have somebody else there for answer? Can I, can I just make a brief comment? Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I lost most of Dew's yeah. contribution, but I very much welcome the fact that he's participating in the meeting. I think if we were to look back on the work of the Eroptas, our Dáil and Shannon, our political system and our public service from 2016 up to 2020 and beyond it, in, in regard to Brexit, it was all, it was literally consumed our parliamentary work in plenary session and at committee level as well. And it was very much about, about protecting the interests of all of our country. Nobody benefits by any negative for the South or negative for the North. So I would disagree with, with Lord Trimble's um, assertions. I believe there, you take a strand too, as we all know, of the Good Friday Agreement is about North-South cooperation. That's very much provided for in the protocol. And Claire makes the very valid point. There are, if there are issues to be that are causing difficulty at the moment, they need to be addressed and need to be sorted out. And I think that's the clear message that has been given by all public, public figures here, both politically and at public service level as well. The difficulties that are there, we need to get them sorted out. We need to, it's by working together and dealing with the issues that we will um, derive best benefits for all of our citizens. If there are more of the Oireachtas members, I can't see people Maybe they want to come in, Colin. Yeah, if I could, briefly, Chairman. Okay, we'll That's go correct. to then, Niall. Oh, thanks, okay. Colin. Look, um, it, it's good. Though, it's good to see you, Doug, as well, and and, and team Gage. Uh, again, I, I disagree with um, David Trimble on this. You know, there's no doubt that there has been um, trade disruption over the last four weeks. That has been absolutely inevitable, not just because. Um, of the new trade and realities created by Brexit, but also COVID as well has played a massive detrimental impact on, on supply lines. You know, all, all of our sectors uh, are saying that. But I think it's what Claire has just said. We have to be, we have a real duty to be honest with people that the protocol is not going anywhere. It's going to remain the framework for dealing with these issues. I, I don't believe it creates a border in the RIC. If it, it creates barriers and frictions, of, of course it does. That is the outworkings of, of Brexit. I think everybody said that at the time. Um, I think you yourself, I'm pretty sure, were someone who were, was pro-Remain, as far as I know. You, you would have recognised yourself that, that, that Brexit was always going to create these situations. But we do need that wee dose of reality. So, for example, this month there has been more trade between Britain and the North than there was this time last year. You know, it's not true that we have seen catastrophic impacts. We haven't. Businesses, by and large, are coping. That's not to take away from the fact that some do need help. We do need solutions. We need simplifications where possible. You know, in December, the British government and the European Union agreed a number of flexibilities uh, that are very, very important moving forward. They haven't been put in place yet. So, for example, the European Union haven't been given access um, to the, the British customs data. That needs to happen. There needs to be much more improvements around trader support service. Most importantly, even, you know, British firms need to familiarise themselves with the new uh, import legislation. So, for example, we didn't get a transition period. Any notion of a transition period is a misnomer. What we ended up last year was with 11 months of negotiation. We simply didn't get time. You know, many of these new processes were landing with businesses in the last week of Christmas. Most of them were off. They weren't even in the office um, and they were trying to deal with this. So, so I have no doubt that some of these solutions will be found. But as I think, as Michael Gove and Safkovich have both said this week, the protocol is the framework that is going to be is going to be dealing out these solutions. And I think you know we need to be much more sensible here when calm tangents. And 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 I do think we need to walk people back and say, look, the protocol is here to stay, and we need to work within the parameters. Okay, we'll go to Niall Blaney, and then we'll move on to Pat Sheehan for a question. Niall, thanks very much, Chairman. I very much welcome Doug's uh, engagement here today. Um, probably he's very much on his own, um, but I very much welcome the, the, the question he's brought. It's a very good question. Uh, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, if we didn't have the border now, I would see 
there'd be consequences for the Northern Ireland economy and that it wouldn't have access to the single market. Um, I think what the result of the Brexit outcome, um, there, were, there was a reason for it. None of us wanted the outcome um, or, or none of us looked the first day uh, for the British to, to withdraw from the EU. Um, and we can argue till the, cow, till the cows come home, we're, we're not responsible for Brexit. Brexit is responsible for nothing, not a lot of damage um, on, on our economies on this island. And that's a reality we're going to have to face. Um, David Trimble is someone I have an awful lot of respect for in the work he has done um, and the build up to the Good Friday Agreement. Um, he was a very important part in putting it together. Um, I don't think he fully believes himself um, when all said and done that this really re this part of the Good Friday Agreement. I think it was said in a, in a point in time. Um, but at the end of the day, the art of the Good Friday Agreement was the ability of politicians all around to come to the table and have that art of agreement. Um, I suppose that's what politics is about. Um, the protocol, there are issues where the protocol has been said. And I suppose the question has been asked of, of us um, uh, from all parties all around, um, the politicians of today, do we have that ability to come together uh, for the good of our communities and the nation and to build on the foundations is there? And for me, I think most people around this table today, the answer is yes. And I suppose we could talk about for a long time, you know, why this happened on, on the border of the Irish Sea. And, 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 you know, I know people are really upset. Um, but at some stage, we do need to get to the point, start to indicate exactly what the issues are uh, and, and start pushing those that are in a ministerial position to take these issues to the table and have them ironed out. Uh, I think this is a good first step to things. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. Now, okay, I'm going to pass over then to uh, Pat Sheehan. Okay, Garmaglet uh, uh and I suppose this in, in some ways is an, ex an historic meeting today, and I hope it's the start of a process uh, and the start of an ongoing process of dialogue and cooperation between uh, our committee in the Assembly and, and the Arachnus Committee on, on the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and I think what we should probably be trying to do is identify areas of cooperation, uh, areas where we can work on together uh, and flag up to the governments and particularly the EU Commission and the EU Parliament, as, as Chris mentioned uh, earlier. But I would also have to point out that it's easy to talk about cooperation uh, and we have seen many instances over the past year where cooperation didn't exist when it should have existed because it was a matter of life and death in terms of this pandemic. Uh, and, you know, so we had the, the, the Dublin government uh, imposing restrictions without any sort of uh, communication with the executive here. Uh, the Taoiseach a few weeks ago put his foot in it over the testing for the new variant, uh, and it has already been mentioned about the reluctance to pass on data from the passenger locator forms of people flying into Dublin. So uh, cooperation is very much a mindset, uh, and uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're going to co cooperate together, we need to ensure that we have the proper mindset and one of the difficulties, as I see it, is that uh, many people in the South and, and, and a lot of the politicians in the South seem to think, uh, oh, this is sorted. The protocol is now in place. Uh, the North has the best of, of, uh, of both worlds uh, and so on and so forth. When in actual fact, uh, the protocol in itself uh, is 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 just the the best of all the bad options, uh, and and just to take a couple of examples, I mean it's already been mentioned about the, the European Health Insurance Card, and Simon Coveney has assured us that that is going to be resolved. 
But there's also the issue of the, the cross-border EU directive on healthcare. People who previously would have been able to go to other EU countries uh, for surgery and so on or other sorts of treatments now can't avail of that. So uh, the, these are areas that maybe we can identify and, and, and work on together. Uh, but particularly, and, and I know this is the Good Friday Agreement uh, commit, Joint Committee. So I suppose I don't really have a question, but I, I'm just throwing that out there about the issue of cooperation and, and the need for a change in mindset in, in some cases. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I know on both sides of the border, there's often a partitionist mindset, but it's to the benefit of everyone on this island that there is maximum cooperation in the time ahead. Shinoa Lugamsa, Okay, th thank you for that, Pat. Brent, do you want to respond to that or invite somebody to respond or happy to, to note the yeah. comment? Yeah, if there's any of my of my colleagues, but I'd just make a, a quick comment. Do, do you know the way it's unfortunate that the executive installment weren't meeting for the for for a considerable length of time after the decision was made and the referendum in 2016 to leave the European Union. But I just want to say very clearly, on the behalf of the Iraqis of all parties and none, there was a huge effort and time and consideration and very strong interest in ensuring that the interests of all of our island were to the fore in all discussions in regard to Brexit. There was no partitionist attitude on the part of the Iraq in regard to Brexit preparations. I want to put that clearly on the record. I think it's very important in, in that re respect. Um, of course, we want all Ireland cooperation. And the reality is the Taoiseach announced some weeks ago a shared island where there's some very substantial funds for being ring-fenced over the next five years in regard to all Ireland projects and cross-border projects that will benefit people both north and south. We want to move on that agenda and we, and we, and we, and we want to move it on as, as rapidly as possible. If there are any of my Iraqis colleagues, I can't see them, Colin, unfortunately. I, I can see everybody, so if there's anybody that does want to speak, we can just indicate they'll call them in. Uh, Rose, can we watch there? Are you looking to come in? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I do apologise because I had real real diff technical difficulties at, at the beginning. Now, a lot of what I, was said, uh, what I was going to say has been said, but I was looking at it, there was always going to have to be a border in terms of Brexit. Brexit in itself uh, meant that. Uh, now, Pat is, is saying that um, uh, the impression might be here that everything is sorted. And I suppose what I would say in that is certainly uh, we don't. Uh, but I think what... Um, what is required is, I suppose, to to see what the the protocol. What we we feel, certainly, what I would feel, is that the the protocol hasn't been given enough of a chance to see uh, what it's going to mean. And I suppose yeah. there are mixed messages coming in terms of if we look at, say, the figures from uh, manufacturing NI, uh, where um, sixty five percent of the, of them said that there was no impact. And 73% said it was as good as better now. And that's not to deny that there aren't problems. And there probably are problems that we haven't even envisaged at this stage. But I suppose in looking at our two committees, and I think everyone will agree, this is the time for really strong transformational uh, leadership to um to, to lead the changed relationships that, uh, that everybody... Um, is experiencing at the moment and, and, and there will obviously be a discomfort in that by its very nature but how we can do that because we do have the best interests of, of families, of businesses, of individuals and of our farming community together so how we can do those things and work pragmatically together and I suppose my question is back in the, and I very much welcome this meeting today is how can we work together as as two committees um, to make sure that those things are, are implemented, notwithstanding anybody's constitutional preference? I think people are expecting us uh, as legislators to uh, to deal with many of, of the issues that are presenting to us at the moment uh, rather than tonight. And I would 
want, just want to say that I think the media have a big role to play in this, that, that there isn't the, this um, sensationalizing uh, of, of issues, but rather that we all work together for the benefit of everybody across the island, indeed everybody uh, across the, the two islands. Even, and I just, I just give for instance, even in terms of Erasmus, people think the Erasmus um, issue is sorted, but it's not sorted from the southern point of view because our students uh, cannot uh, access um, um, uh, the Erasmus programme in the north, obviously, or in Britain as they are now. But what I would like to see coming from this meeting is a way that we might work together going forward, whether that might be in, in, the, in the form of a joint report or how we examine these issues to play our part in it. Garmagat. Okay, um, thank you for that, Rose. And, and don't worry, while you were having substantial technical problems at the beginning, you missed us all having substantial technical problems at the beginning. So uh, you were okay there. You didn't miss, miss much. Um, sure. Look, I, I'm going to move on then. One second, just a quick comment uh, in, in terms yes, of... Okay, if, if this is the part of a process, could we develop some sort of shared protocol on procedures for these meetings? It would be it would be helpful from a chair's position, I can tell you. Uh, okay, look, we'll pass to Martina then if you want to ask a, a question or just a few points, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, and uh, I do appreciate the um, the opportunity to engage with you all here today. I think it is very historic. It is absolutely disappointing that the DUP is not in attendance, and unfortunately, their petulance is leaving them forceless. But we have Doug here, and Doug, I hope you don't feel alone, because you know, as a committee, we engage collectively. And I think we need to keep working collectively to sort out this Brexit mess. Uh, most people knew that Brexit meant a hardening of the border somewhere. And anyone who didn't know that, Chair, they were asleep at the wheel. And what we need to do is to expand, I believe, on the exchange of views that are taking place today. I'm finding it very interesting listening to all the comments that have been made. Now, Chair, I would like to go back to explore. Uh, it was suggested um, by, by someone at the meeting, I think it was Chris, about a potential joint letter to the EU Commission, to the European Parliament, to the presidents of the group, uh, of the groups in, in the European Parliament, because they overwhelmingly give their support to uphold the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts, and that there would be no hardening of the border in Ireland and the All Ireland economy. And when you consider that 650 MEPs voted to protect all of that and to mitigate the challenge and the challenges and impact of the new trade and realities caused by Brexit uh, for, for the All-Ireland economy. So I think we need to reach out to, to those uh, in Europe because they would have heard, for instance, what was happening at the Port of Larne. And, but they may not have heard the confirmation from the PSNI that there were no threats. Uh, we know that we're hearing, say, from yesterday from Minister Gove that uh, that that they will be working at the protocol uh, in terms of making it more effective. But there's going to be no triggering of Article 16 if you listen carefully to everything that he said. And if that is the case, Chair, then I'm concerned that a red bus is going to go over um, a political party again and hurt probably them and people and the people they represent. So we need honesty and leadership in going forward. And therefore, in, in solution mode, we know that businesses, businesses want solutions. They want to get access to a supply chain that is going to be the one that's going to be least problematic. Now, we know that Jacob Rees-Mogg has located businesses from England, you know, here we have folk leave, arch Brexit here, but sees that they needed to locate in Ireland uh, their business there. So given those practical solutions, I would like to ask, uh, for instance, uh, some of you members on the committee, 
in relation to the port in Dublin, like we're hearing about documentation in Dublin, perhaps taking 24 hours, or it might be taking four hours in Belfast, Larne and Warren Point. So we need to see what, what we need to identify what the solutions are. What are the difficulties, first of all, that people are having, the businesses are having, and then what are the solutions to, to those problems? And we engaged with uh, the senators last week, senators, and we made the same suggesting to them that we need to be working collectively together to share information. So I hope that this is only one of many meetings, that we can have other meetings going forward and that we can start to package solutions for those areas where we can find solutions and then we can share information with yourselves about the problems that we are having as Irish citizens, as EU citizens and indeed British citizens who live here in the north of Ireland who have lost their freedom of movement and those of us who are Irish citizens who have lost our democratic right in a European Parliament. So I'm hoping, Chair, that we can pick up on some of the suggestions that were made. And just to reassure Brendan, that during the time when the Assembly was down, that I can assure you that on behalf of Sinn Féin, they were on the side of the table that mattered. They were engaging with Europe, as you know, they engaged with the Irish government and all of the European um governments that were there in terms of the EU 27 to ensure that we upheld the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts. That's not to say, of course, we shouldn't have had an assembly, but we needed to, it brought down in the way that it was because of the issues that brought it down uh, needed to be addressed. So therefore, thankfully, now we're back in a power sharing arrangement with hopefully those issues never re reemerging again. And we're all working collectively together. So Brendan, I think we need to get into solution mode here. We need to try to find a solution to all of these problems and let us let people see that we as as two committees can work collectively together and I would like to pick up just some of those suggestions that have been made chair and then to find out what is happening at the port in Dublin and to also in Ross Lair if anyone has any information about that because we're hearing that has increased sixfold uh, since Brexit there seems to be a lot of traffic taking place there and their businesses seems to be blooming at that end. Okay thank you Martina so I'll uh, pass those to Brenton to, to pass out to members. Make a quick comment myself and some of my colleagues again i can't see unfortunately just with regard to to martina's final point there but i made the point and i think it's it's worth recalling that the the eruptus of all parties and none i said and all committees they worked from 2016 very assiduously at all times um to outlining analyzing and dealing with the the outcome of Brexit as it would affect all of our island. And it was, uh, the Iraq, I think, did a very good job there um, supporting the work of our public servants and all government departments as well, and our diplomatic network as well. Could I just say with regard to the ports, my information about the ports, we're all informed by our own constituents and by our own constituencies. I know that initially in early January, up until the middle of January in particular, I would have had quite a number of representations from the haulage business and people importing and exporting people trading through Dublin. Um, and I had hauliers from both um, Northern Ireland and our own jurisdiction as well, who were complaining about delays. Now, the people that I have dealt with, um, the most recent contact I had was two days ago, one of the firms I had, he said things from their point of view, had improved considerably. He said he knew of some other hauliers who, where there are mixed loads and maybe food items being part of a particular consignment. Sometimes there can be difficulties there because there are so many necessary inspections from the point of view of our health services and our Department of Agriculture as well. So to, to my knowledge, and I'm being guided by my own rep, rep by my own the representation that I've received myself is that things have improved at the port, but there, there was still room for improvement the last time I spoke to people who are trading through the port. Maybe some of my colleagues ha have their own particular detailed knowledge in regard to the ports. But, Chair, but, but, Brendan, am I might, uh, or sorry, Chair, you can. Chair, on mute. That's me being very helpful. Uh, I can see everybody on the screen. So if you want to go, uh, uh, Claire and then Chris. Yes, well, just just to report, uh, Brandon, and, and the kind of hands art will be available. As I say, we have a lengthy session in the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee with representatives from the Port Authority. 
authorities and various different hauliers and freight associations kind of ac across the islands. And, and essentially, they were reporting um, market distortion, you know, that that um, things had smoothed out, uh, albeit they had uh, a lot of very practical suggestions for kind of synergizing some of the processes and just and just um, kind of folding them into one another um, and and uh, and how they might get those solutions kind of uh, into the right ears. But essentially, they were saying um, that while the overall balance has restored, there is an avoidance of, of I suppose, the the the, some of the traditional routes for moving goods around. And we spoke to them about um, the need, and I think this is a need for all departments in, in the North, and we've written to UK agencies and in the South, to, to try and find some of the opportunities, and particularly for businesses in Northern Ireland. And I've heard already of some who have, uh, you know, got enhanced um contracts and so on because we are at the hinge of both the UK single market and the EU single market and I think that's a that's a piece of work that could really demonstrate to people that the protocol can be made to work we we have said that if we've been handed lemons but we might as well try to make uh, to try to make lemonade once the stabilisation phase is over. But essentially, and as, as I say, we, we will issue a more comprehensive report. They are saying that that the market is 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 reshaping before their eyes in terms of the, the patterns of freight. There's also a very good report. I've only kind of scanned it, but there's a lot of chunky in, uh, information from manufacturing NI about different about different trade flows. So it's 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 evolving and, and emerging, but it is going to land in a very different pattern than it was um on the thirty first of December. Okay, Chris. Yeah, look, um, just to pick up on some of those points. So, we, we that that particular report that Claire has just alluded to there. We know, for example, in the manufacturing sector in the north, a quarter of manufacturers have already reorientated their supply lines, um, and they know they're moving around. Now, having met with the guys last week, they were very, very clear. There is a significant problem at Dublin Port, and this is around the pre-notification um, for imports coming in. Uh, and unlike Belfast, who have reduced that to four hours. Dublin is insisting on 24 hours pre-notification and th this is actually causing serious problems for many local businesses um, and if they would take the same step and this is um, the Irish Revenue um, and the DFA need to come to this arrangement, it's, in, it's within the legislation to do this, to reduce that down to four hours would make a significant um, improvement for local businesses, many of whom are, are in the north. As I say, they've done it in Belfast and it has helped uh, greatly. Um, although, you know, there, there are a number of other issues too. So, for example, Michael Gove um, announced lately that uh, the British government and the Irish government had recently established a task force that would look at Dublin Port uh, and would look at uh, trade disruption and how this could be smoothed out going forward. So I think it would be um, interesting to get an update on, on that programme of work. Um, because there's going to have to be significant um, improvements made. We know that Customs is working fairly well at Belfast. Um, but I think all, all in all, it's going to come down to, uh, and I know Stephen made some play on, on this yesterday, um, unless there is serious movement back towards EU standards on SPS and food hygiene, this disruption is going to be here and it, that's just going to become a reality of life. There's going to have to be these levels of checks and disruption if British government policy is to diverge significantly from EU food standards to meet um, what they hope it will be a future US trade deal. You know, we know that's the problem. So if we could get British government policy shaped around to a place where they're closer to, say, EU and Switzerland on a veterinary agreement, great. You would get rid of all the need for these checks, etc. and the export health certificates overnight. Um, but unfortunately, with this particular British government, that's very, very unlikely. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else indicating there from the screen, so I can move on to Emma then to, to ask a question, make a point and ask a question there, and then we'll come to Michelle after, if you're happy enough with that. Go on ahead, Emma. Gorma, I get to hear. Look, I, I was panicking there. I thought that that my uh, raised hand hadn't worked. This is this uh, method of, of meeting is, is quite different from our, our normal function. I know, and, and it is kind of confusing as as other members have have outlaid. I just wanted to to go back on some of the comments that have been made by other members, and I know that the 
the fault of Brexit or the cause of Brexit has been well rehearsed and, and everyone has expressed regret that the DUP have chosen not to engage this afternoon. And it, it is a, a cause for concern because that sort of continued, you know, let's bury our head in the sands in terms of a strategy isn't going anywhere and, and, and doesn't help the constituents that we all represent. And following on from that, I, I wondered in terms of the, the this meeting and the two committees having this sort of engagement, if we can commit to, to some work and a, and a piece of work longer term around some of the issues that are arising. So in terms of the citizenship um, issues that have been raised, Niall Rodunila had made reference to, to some of the, the problems that have arisen or the, the concerns that people have. Martina touched on them as well. Um, it, when we look at the Good Friday Agreement as, as an agreement that, that was came about as a means of trying to provide a better life for people in the North as a result of conflict following British <laughs> um, partition, uh, we we know that Brexit ha has once again risked the lives of, of communities here and, and risked the, the nature of life that people have come to enjoy. And I wondered if, if we can commit to, to doing some work around that and, and smoothing out some of the, the issues. Again, in the context of COVID-19, some of those things probably haven't reared their head as quickly as they, as they would have otherwise because of the fact that people aren't moving about as much anyway. And following on from that in terms of the practical issues on the ground, and I know, again, this has been referred to, Chris had, had made reference there to increased um, business and, and opportunities for businesses in the North, and I think Claire touched on that as well. We, as, as constituency represent representatives from whatever part of the country we, we come from will all be in contact with constituents who may now be looking elsewhere in terms of, you know, the natural reliance that businesses in the north would previously had on Britain because of the constitutional arrangement, because of the fact that, that the country is partitioned. And that was something that probably was never working perfectly. And there are a lot of potential efficiencies, both in economic terms and in environmental terms, that we potentially could now see coming around as a result of increased north north south trade, um, as opposed to east west. So it was just to to if we could have some commitment to having that conversation amongst all the reps and and see if there are um, objectives that we could achieve on a, on a joint basis. Okay, thank you for that, Emma. Um, Maybe, sorry, Michelle, I know you had indicated at the same time to speak. If you maybe want to, to, to say now, and then I'll go back to Brenton. Okay, yes, um, thank you, Chair. No, just to, I suppose, I think this discussion has been very, very valuable and very helpful. And a couple of practical suggestions. The issue around the port in Dublin, maybe the joint committees could draft a letter to the Dublin port outlining some of the pragmatic measures that have been taken um, in, in ports in the north and see if we can smooth the way. I know there are businesses in my constituency, depending on the weather, used to send a lorry down the motorway to Belfast or down the other motorway to Dublin. And it, to them, it didn't really matter um, which port their goods were sent to as long as they were, they were able to be exported. And then in terms of Emma's issue, I know I had deep concerns about Brexit. My constituency has the longest um, land border, and I, I share that border with with Brenton Smith and and others, um, in in Cavan and Monaghan and and um and other uh, counties, and some of the businesses in my constituency were deeply concerned that Brexit might lead to a situation where a lorry had to cross the border six times before it got on the road to the port and and all of that. So Brexit has thrown up all manner of problems. And it's up to us to find solutions. And I welcome this um, joint meeting today because I think those solutions are going to have to be found amongst elected representatives right across the island of Ireland. Um, we're going to have to find those solutions in an all-Ireland setting. And from that end, maybe too, um, there are other practical steps that we could take. Maybe these two committees together could do a meeting with the Shared Island Unit. There are issues there that we might want to raise. There are certainly... Um, things that we would want to do to try and have our voice heard, not just here on the island of Ireland, but in Europe. And I think there have been many practical suggestions made here today. So I think we, we should continue. We should try and set up a programme of work or we should try and, and find ways to engage with each other. Hopefully after today's you know issues, we can ensure that all parties are represented and that we collectively as representatives on the island of Ireland can sort out solutions on the island of Ireland for people, notwithstanding the challenges 
in exporting to Britain and beyond, but in finding ways to make people's lives easier as a result of the problems that Brexit has thrown at us. Thank you. Thank you for that, Michelle. Um, okay, Brenton, do you have any point that you want to make uh, yeah. from Emma's contribution? Yeah, just a quick point. Just with regard to the ports, we have considerable additional shipping and ferry capacity from Ross Lair and that, that, that I believe, should be easing the pressures on Dublin port. So hopefully that will benefit all people who are trading through Dublin, either exporting or importing. And look, at I'll raise the issues along with my colleagues in the Rathdys. I know that um, speaking to uh, hauliers and other people involved in trading through Dublin Airport, there was considerable interaction between the haulage industry and their representative associations and revenue and the other statutory agencies as well. I can check if there are other issues that need to be obviously sorted out. And I, I just, in my representations to the Minister of Finance, say that this was a, an issue that was discussed in detail here today. With regard to, to our two committees doing a, a, some pieces of work together, I naturally can't speak on behalf of the committee. I'm just an ordinary member of the committee. But what I might suggest, if, if, if I could do, that our chair Chairman Fergus O'Dowd might consult with Colin as chair of your committee in regard to specific issues we might pursue, because there are so many common interests and, and common concerns. And I think I said earlier, one of the best meetings that I participated in in regard to Brexit in, in December 2015 was the meet of the North-South Interparliamentary Assembly, which consists of members of the Oireachtas and members of Stormont. And again, with the deficiency in meeting online, again, when we get back to to sitting around a table or a committee room and having meetings, it would be much, much more productive. But I think us addressing specific issues together would be welcome. But I might just on behalf of our committee, and I'm, I'm doing just, and I'm, I hope maybe Neil or Jennifer, she is still there, could, could come in as well, that we'd ask our chairman to speak to you, Colin, as chair, to see what issues you can bring to your own committee or bring to our committee, and that we could set out to do some, some particular work on. And again, the point was made in regard to Michelle and Emma referred to, there has been a huge growth, thankfully, in the All-Ireland economy since 1998. And our economies, I represent Cavan Mon, and I know the neighbouring counties from Manor, Tyrone and Armagh, our economy at local level, they are so interdependent in so many sectors and we want them to grow and grapple and deal with the issues on a cross-border basis as well. Thanks, Colin. Okay, Brenton, thank you. I think we're kind of getting ourselves towards an end, I think a natural enough end there uh, insofar as all of the members uh, from our committee that have been on ha have asked their, their questions. We've had the answers. I think we've looked at a, or certainly have heard a couple of common themes that have been coming through uh, there. So um, I think I would I, I welcome the fact that we, we have those common themes coming through. I take the, what Brenton has said, that maybe if uh, if Michael and Paul could, could sort of put together the notes from the meeting that we, we've we've taken today, and then myself, uh, Fergus, and, and themselves can look at maybe some f opportunities for us to work together, because you know this is we are in this for the long haul. Uh, the problems are going to continue on a regular basis, and therefore the search for solutions is going to have to continue on an ongoing basis. And I think uh, having us all together uh, to be able to articulate what those problems are. And bring those solutions together might be uh, useful. If there's any specific points that people wanted to raise, maybe on the back of that, Martina? Chair, I mean, I definitely agree with you. It's fantastic that we could get um, the administrations to capture all of the recommendations that have been made and bring it forward, but there's an urgency in one. The European Commission, because of what action that they had even suggested that they were going to take last week and the the recommendation from Chris Hazard about reaching out to the European Commission, the European um, Parliament, as well as the presidents of the group. I, as a former MEP, I can ensure you that that is crucially important that they hear from all of us 
uh, who are working collectively together to try to solve this Brexit mess. So I, I can I accept what you're saying around, there's a number of suggestions here. And, you know, we've heard about the common travel area. We know that's built in sand. We know there are problems. We need to go back to the Holy issue of citizenship. Um, I'll not start on that, but there's a mountain of issues that need to be addressed. I would say to you in the first instance, we need to reach out. We need to reach out to, we need to try and frame. We can try and see, can we draft something together? Uh, can we throw it around the membership, see if we can get it signed off on and let that be perhaps the first action coming out today and then all of the other issues. And I would say, Chair, we keep in mind the grace period. We have a three months, six months, and one year grace period. Now, who knows? It may be part of the flexibility that we might get it extended. But if not, we don't want to waste a grace period. We want to make sure preparation is done in place, and that's going to involve and necessitate us all collectively working together to share information so that businesses are informed about what could potentially be coming down the track in the time ahead. Okay, Martina, I, I'm going to go on the basis of not seeing anybody getting too exercised about that to, to be able to... Yes, Niall? I think Niall here briefly, just um, maybe in conclusion, I just want to thank you for, um, I suppose, co-sharing our uh, interactions here today. It's been very, very welcome. Um, if there's one thing I would like you to take away from today, uh, certainly from um, from my perspective, is they need to have all stakeholders at the table here. And I would ask you to work very closely with our chair um, to ensure that the DUP are brought back on board. And I can't emphasize that enough. I think it's really important that all stakeholders are around the table. While that's not the case, uh, I don't think we can, we can be, I suppose, uh, sacrosanct in all the work we do. Um, so I think it's really important we get all stakeholders around the table and use whatever offices you can to do that, whether it be Department of Foreign Affairs, Taoiseach, uh, ministers within Stormont. Um, I think work needs to begin from that perspective sooner rather than later for the sake of, of, um, of all North-South work, and uh, particularly our work uh, on a shared island basis. Thanks, Jim. Okay, now thank you. Trevor, Lon, I see you have uh, joined into the meeting here. I know you were away. We're 38 minutes over time at this stage, but is there a comment that you would like to make, maybe rather than a question, which might reopen a lot for us again, but is there a comment that you'd like to make? Just just a very quick comment, Chair. Um, I apologise for my late arrival, but you have to take the COVID injection when, when it's offered to you, so that's what I've been doing. Uh, the... I've listened to the tail end of the meeting. It's very disappointing that the DUP take this attitude all the time. I, I don't know how many times they can do the wrong thing, and can, but uh, that's the way they are, so we'll have to wait for better days with them. They, the, the one comment, of, I think others already said, but the, the, the extent of optimism in Northern Ireland as regards what we can do for ourselves that we used to import is actually quite quite revealing. You know, I think of the Newry company now who's uh, got a contract with Sainsbury's to produce their sandwiches. Brilliant, you know. And when they hear um, difficulties over plants being sent across, well, can we not grow plants here? <laughs> can we not grow them in the south? It's the same soil. And uh, that, that's that sort of thing. I do think, I mean, we're only six weeks into this nonsense and we have, it's a long way to go, but we are gradually sorting things out. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the future, and I think this dialogue between the two committees is very useful. I'll, I'll leave it at that, Chair. Okay, Trevor, thank you, and we're glad that you got that vaccine today. Unfortunately, Emma, Martina, and myself as under 40s will have to wait and probably till June or July before we're going to get that, uh, <laughs> that vaccine. So we'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you very much for your attendance here today. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, there are a lot of voices, a lot of people, so probably putting an hour aside for this was probably very ambitious. But I think what we'll do is we'll look towards the next time that we get a chance to get together, hopefully very soon, we'll give a bit longer. Uh, we'll get the technical issues all sorted out that we can start right from the beginning. Um, but from where it is at the moment, can I take this opportunity to say thank you? Uh, and our members will remain. But if the others want to hit the end meeting and exit button, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
the Good Friday Committee that unfortunately some of our members weren't able to join the meeting and the, the clerk had been contacted by them to say that regretfully they weren't able to join. But we look forward to further engagement and, and thank you for the way you conducted the meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Brandon. Thank, thank you. And look, Thank you very members, much, Chair. Uh, our members would like to take just two minutes. We'll get to populate the spotlight differently and go and grab a, a glass of water or a cup of coffee, and we'll be back in two minutes. Yeah. thing, and uh, I believe it can come back and bite you a few hours later, but it hasn't happened yet. So, oh, well, no. and did you go to the local GPs to get that, or? Yeah, I'm in the age band where you have to go to your GP. <laughs> uh, no problem. That was fine. I'd recommend it to anybody. Well, that's good, yeah. And it's important to have it. It's important to have it. All right. Well, if, if Emma and Pat are there and able to switch on, we could get started back in again, or I might just be taking a wee moment. Chair, did the DUP send apologies? Yes. Ah, okay. Informed us that they weren't going to be present um, at that element of the meeting, but I don't know if they're going to join us at this stage for the next bit. Yeah. So we'll, we'll wait and see. So we get the other members coming back in a moment, just to remind everybody we're still live. So we will... Just, just in case Doug, Doug comes on and calls us names or something like that, just to remember that we're still live. <laughs> 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 Thank them. <laughs> 
I'll take a, a small bite out of my biscuit. That normally will indicate that people will be back on and ready to go because I'll have my... Okay, I think we'll, we'll maybe make a start. I'm sure Pat and Emma will join us back in a wee moment. So, uh, up there, Pat, there, perfect. And uh, we have up into the spotlight them and joining us, uh, Siobhan Bodrick, Head of Equality Rights and Identity Division at the Executive Office, and Janet Johnson, Head of Equality, Human Rights and Delivering Social Change Unit in the Executive Office. You're both very welcome to the meeting today. Um, and you are going to give us a, a, a presentation, a short presentation, and then some question and answers on the uh, funding arrangements for the dedicated mechanism element of Article 2 of the protocol. Um, so, look, we'll pass over to yourselves if you just want to give us a, a bit of background, and then if, if there are any questions um, following that, we'll ask them. But maybe not, uh, it, it may not be a sort of thing that I think what you're going to give us is going to be pretty factual. So. Um, I don't know if there'll be a massive amount of questions afterwards. Don't don't take offence at that, but we'll certainly see where it goes to anyway. So I'll hand over to yourself. I think, Siobhan, are you going to lead on this? I am, Chair, if you're content. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. As you know, we'll give you a short paper, but uh, I suppose you know the Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission have agreed to undertake the scrutiny and monitoring role that will form the dedicated mechanism to ensure that there's no diminution of the rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity as set out in the Article 2 of the protocol. As you know, TEO sponsors the Equality Commission. The Human Rights Commission is sponsored by funding from the Equality Commission to discharge this new role, uh, which were undertaken directly between the Northern Ireland Office and the Equality Commission. Uh, our role was to ensure that the appropriate governance and mechanics were in place to get the funding from the UK government to the Equality Commission in order for it to discharge its new role as a dedicated mechanism. Uh, in respect of the funding itself, our paper sets out the funding allocations until March 2023. The NIO has made it clear its commitment to the dedicated mechanism and has advised the TEO that it should in line with a normal government practice, apply for funds for the period post-2023 in line with the normal spending review processes. So future funding levels will therefore then be discussed with Her Majesty's Treasury at that appropriate time. Um, and really, that's, I suppose, it. Uh, Chair, happy to take questions. Okay, you've certainly got me there, mid biscuit. So, <laughs> my apologies for that. Sorry. I expected to be a little bit longer. That's okay. Um, maybe look, just to thank you for that, um, and ask about that funding element. In terms of going forward, does that mean that I mean it, that things aren't set in stone in terms of the funding, or is it not something that can just be incorporated into the annual budget of the department and it's just there, or is that what you're actually explaining? by discussing with the government or the, the Treasury that will put it into the permanent part of the budget? I, I think that's where it will go. I think because the funding arrangements were becoming mid-year, there, there was discussions between NIO, the Department of Finance and Treasury about how that would be done to allow the Equality Commission to have the assurance and access to the funding to allow them to start to recruit, to put the dedicated mechanism in place. So. Uh, as the stance now, there is that commitment to, is it 1.898, uh, £100,000 over the next three years, which will get us to March 23. And then thereafter, it will probably be as part of our bid as TEO uh, to have funding for the dedicated mechanism. Okay. Uh, and in terms of so much of the entire Brexit process and the protocol basis, 
is, is unknown. Is there scope or reviews built into the process to be able to see if additional resources were required, if, if the workload was absolutely massive in 18 months' time, uh, like it wasn't envisaged at, this, at the planning stage? Is there scope for reviewing it and, and seeking additional resources if required? Mm -hmm. Well, the NIO commitment was always to provide the appropriate level of funding. So I assume the discussions would then be reopened on the basis of what was the appropriate level of funding in order for the dedicated mechanism to discharge its functions and rules that is now set out in legislation. So I think we would have to open those discussions and whether their NIO and Treasury would be receptive to that will obviously depend on a number of factors. Okay, that's grand. Thank you. Well, look, thank you for that, Siobhan. I'm going to pass to Doug Beatty as the deputy chair. Doug, have you any questions there? Comments? I, I don't have any, to be honest, um, uh, and, but it is interesting. But could I just, just, uh, I mean, could you just give us an idea of the, the body of work that you are actually doing or, or the body of work that you think you'll be looking at uh, over the next um, number of years or, or certainly in the, in the short to medium term? Well, I suppose it's the Equality Commission working alongside the Human Rights Commission have started the work. I suppose each of them will have the equivalent of a dedicated mechanism unit and their functions are set out in the legislation, which is to monitor implementation of the Article 2 commitment, uh, promote awareness and understanding. And you might have noticed already some advertisements in local news newspapers, obviously the first stages of taking that forward and to provide advice in respect of any measures that are required by the UK government or the Northern Ireland Assembly in respect of the implementation of Article 2. So I, I assume what, what is happening now is really both commissions are getting their resources in place. So the Equality Commission started that last August with a recruitment exercise and have had a number of staff in place, including the director of the new unit uh, and they're working hard I suppose to set out a program of work going forward including recruiting more staff to get up to the 10 11 people that they expect to be in that unit so 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 there'll be a lot of people who will think that there um, there has been a diminutization of their rights in regards to uh, a democratic deficit um, due to the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, and the withdrawal agreement. Um, is that something that will be looked at for that people have that? Is that people able to say, look, I have a genuine concern here, or will you pick up themes that you will be looking at? How, uh, how do you sort of, what way is that working? Is it, you know, can people come to you and say, look, I've got a real issue with this, uh, and you're going to look at that. I can't get access to goods. That That is not the way it was before the protocol. It is now the case. Will you look at this, or do you look for themes and then, then look at those themes? Well, I suppose that's a question really for the Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission. And, you know, we're in the department, so therefore we sponsor the unit. And I suppose the protections that are provided by Article 2 are in relation to the protections that are in the relevant chapter of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, you know, the rights, the safeguards and equality of opportunity ch chapter. So obviously it has to be a right or equality of opportunity or safeguard within that chapter. It has to be already protected in domestic law at the end of the transition period. Uh, and then there must be a reduction in that human right or equality, which has arisen as a result of the ex UK exit from Europe. So as to how the commission's board are going to approach that work, um, I would need, you, you might better ask the Equality Commission, Human Rights Commission. I know they've been in front of you a couple of times, but you, you might want to ask them to come back in a couple of months' time when they sort of are, have their resources in place and their plans in place, because they understand both are working hard to do that now. Uh, fair answer, and, and thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, thanks very much for that, uh, Doug. If I could just uh, uh, welcome George into the meeting. Could I just ask you to mute there because we're, we're getting the feedback of what you are discussing in your office there. Um, I am going to go to uh, next, if I could ask Emma, Sharon, your hands up there if you want to ask a question. Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Never quite sure. Um, yeah, thank you very much to, to both of you for the for the presentation, short and snappy as it was. Um, I know that following on from the question that 
Doug has asked there around the protocol and the implementation of the protocol. And we're, we've had an awful lot of rhetoric in, in recent weeks around the need to scrap the protocol um, in relation to the, the different implications that it's had for trade, of course, a, a byproduct of Brexit that would never have came about without Brexit. But the protocol is important in that it does set out protections for rights um, for people in the north. And that has been one of the big concerns coming out of Brexit because of the, the change and the fact that we had so many rights protections within the Good Friday Agreement and particularly citizenship's rights. And I just wondered on um, if you could if you could advise around the, the level of demand that's been thus far for the, the dedicated mechanisms and the impact um, of, of no representation from the North in the EU on our rights here and the democratic deficit that we, we've now lost in, in terms of Irish citizens that are still EU citizens but don't have representation in the EU. And I also wondered then as well, because we'd had presentations before from the Human Rights um, Commission, the Equality Commission, and then the, the 26 county equivalent uh, of the role there for, for the 26 county rights organisations in, in promoting rights as a result of Brexit or coming out of Brexit. Uh, I suppose that questions there. I think in respect of what the demand has been so far for the dedicated mechanism, I, I would have to go and check with the Equality Commission and Human Rights Commission um, to get that information. Uh, as I mentioned already, you will have seen that there has they have been doing some awareness raising uh, advertisements already. So maybe that has elicited a response. But if you don't mind, I would need to take that away and, and find out more about that and come back to you. Um, in respect of the working across the island of Ireland, uh, I think the Human Rights Commission he was, did a presentation along with their counterparts from Dublin, and I understand they have a clo close working relationship, uh, and that uh, will proceed. Uh, and again, I don't want to put words in the mouth of the Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission, so I think I, I would rather ask them that question rather than me respond on, on their behalf, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, tell me, Siobhan, then maybe on the back of that, do you, uh, as a sort of, um, if you're sponsoring, as it were, this work, do you capture then the level of, of interactions and the level of activity to sort of say, well, look, we, 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 this, there's six members of staff and you're, you're telling us that they're doing X amount of work and therefore that, you know, are you capturing and monitoring that level? We will. We capture, obviously, information as a sponsor department to look at the level of spend and the number of staff, uh, because statutorily that's our rule, and we have ongoing meetings with the Equality Commission. And one of the items that we'll discuss in that is a dedicated mechanism and uh, the process that they're going through to recruit staff, where they are in that, because we have to give them approval in respect of the number of staff. So that is part of our rule, our statutory rule. And obviously, we have an ongoing relationship with them aside of that because we obviously then manage the Equality Practitioners Group which is uh, made up of civil servants across all the departments who provide advice within departments in respect of equality. So we would have an ongoing relationship with the Equality Commission uh, because of that role, that sort of coordinating central role that we have in respect of the Equality Practitioners Group and we would obviously want to use that to raise awareness of the Article 2 rights and have already facilitated a, a, a webinar with the Northern Ireland office to raise awareness of what is the content of the Article 2 uh, protocol and the commitments. And we will be going back uh, to remind people and maybe do more work around that in respect of awareness raising, but working in partnership with the both commissions to do that. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Siobhan, yeah, Emma? Mm -hmm. No, I just I just wanted to come back in on that because I think what, you're, what you were saying there was sort of what I was getting at as well in terms of the awareness raise. I'm very conscious that a lot of the issues that we were initially talking about around Brexit and the impact that it would have on sort of cross-border movement, on people that work on one side of the border and live on another, these things maybe haven't sort of been put in our face as much as they ordinarily would have been because we are in a lockdown and because, you know, I know we've had conversations over the, the past number of days around, you know, fines for cross-border unnecessary travel, but technically speaking, nobody should be travelling outside their, their county, nobody should be travelling outside their home unless they have a, a valid reason. So I, I suppose th those things haven't flagged up and it's to have that awareness prior to, you know, as we come out of lockdown and as these things 
our, our pot in our face. I know with the, the summer deadline for the frontier workers and uh, EU, you know, migrant workers that are here and have concerns and worries that we know where to direct them and that we have a, a, an open channel of communication for those people should they need to address. Siobhan, are you happy with that or just comment on that? No, no, look, I think there is a role for us to work with commissions to raise awareness of Article 2 across the departments, and we've started that work and we'll continue to do it. Okay. Um, Martina, would you like to come in next there? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Stefan, for that. Um, we know that um, the protocol um, states that, for instance, the Article 2 and, and even um, Annex 1 about the protections in the North that we currently have against discrimination. So those protections of our rights, our safeguards and our quality of opportunity prior to Brexit, uh, those provisions will not be reduced as a consequence of Brexit. And it also says that the, um, that the protocol will ensure that the executive can't or anyone else, for instance, in the North, that, that they can't actually undermine the rights we have and it would keep a pace with EU rights. Um, so I am wondering about the, um, I'm a bit concerned about how you outlined the funding for the Quality Commission, the Human Rights Commission, to implement such a dedicated mechanism that has been agreed in an international agreement, uh, the withdrawal agreement, and then the future relationship. And because it would appear to me that you may be suggested, and perhaps I picked you up wrong, that the executive office may have to go to the finance minister to put in the bid. Um, and it seems like so much now is being committed to by the British government and then telling the executive in the north, well, you have to take it out of the, uh, the budget that you have, the block grant. So is that what you're suggesting? Or are you suggesting that the British Treasury is going to actually do what it committed to do, and that is to fund this? Because the Human Rights and Equality Commission, when they were in front of us, quite clearly stated that as it's currently constituted, they do not have the capacity to do this unless they receive the funding to be able to implement this. And so I think it's important for us as a committee who are scrutinizing this, that we are across what the British government intends to do with the funding and the mechanisms to draw down that funding. So could you elaborate on what you said? I know it was quite brief, but I didn't quite capture uh, what was said about the drawdown of funding. So there was a, a discussion and agreement between the Equality Commission and the Northern Ireland Office in respect of the amount of funding for the three-year period for it to discharge its role as a dedicated mechanism. So that is the funding that we set out in the table there, you know, up to 1.898. Uh, so that is a commitment and that is a separate line in our budget and that comes from the Treasury into the block vote. So it is ring-fenced, if you want to call it. Uh, the NIO have made a commitment that they are committed to ensuring the dedicated mechanism stays in place after 2023, and we will make a bid for that money to ensure the dedicated mechanism continues in place post-2023. So we do envisage the dedicated mechanism being in place and the funding being provided by the UK government. Sorry, did you hear me? Sorry. Yes, I heard you. Yes, yeah, I heard you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that because I um I just got a bit concerned as to how it was uh, how it was explained there, but you have just elaborated on that and that alleviates some of the concerns. I think, Chair, what we probably really would need, I don't know, Siobhan, if this would be coming from your end, or maybe we need the Equality and Human Rights Commission to be engaging with them again, because the six EU directives in Annex One of the protocol. Um, one of them, for instance, talks about um, gender goods and services directive. Now, I find it somewhat challenging because services has not been part of the uh, of the withdrawal agreement of the protocol. Services was not included, and yes, we have a directive is talking about the implementation of such services in terms of equality of treatment between men and women. Um, in the access and supply of goods and services. So, Chair, I think there's a bit more work to do uh, just to delve down into this so that we can get an understanding of it, particularly I know what Emma is saying about citizenship and rights, but um, I'm a bit confused. I had always been because we needed to wait to the end to see if services was going to be included in the future relationship and the withdrawal agreement, and it's not. 
We know that services, for instance, in the north, um, I think accrue something like 3.6 billion. And so we know there's going to be a different arrangement with regards to services and what there has been uh, in relation to goods, but yet we have an EU directive in Annex 1 of the protocol um, that we're being told uh, references, for instance, goods and services. So I just flag that up, Chair, to something for our understanding to develop as we go on, Siobhan. I'm not saying that maybe I expect that from yourselves today, but perhaps you could take it away and maybe a further elaboration of the paper um, and some more information, Chair, for uh, an exchange of views with the Equality Commission and Human Rights Commission on this subject. So to be clear... Uh are you asking me to clarify that the Council Direct of 2004-113, the first one listed in Annex 1, uh, applies to the delivery of or provision of services mm -hmm. uh, and in some way that is contrary to or consistent with the protocol provisions? Well, it's in the protocol, so it's obviously consistent with the protocol, but it could be one of those issues like goods, for instance, in our access here in the north to the, um, to the EU single market in a way that's not in Britain. I'm just looking, is this actually dealing with the issue of services for the North in a way that hasn't been dealt elsewhere? Because the understanding has been the services has not been included in the withdrawal agreement, but yet we have got an EU directive that deals with uh, goods and service directives, and therefore that's applicable in the North. So I just want that explained. If that could be elaborated, if we could get some further information, it might be my misunderstanding of it, um, and I have been across all this stuff pretty well, yeah. but um, that one there has always jumped out uh, as a somewhat of a bit of a challenge, if not a contradiction. I will clarify, but my understanding was that uh, discrimi that provides for uh, protection against discrimination against in respect to men and women in the provision of goods, facilities and services. Uh, and that has probably been brought into domestic law by um, some gender regulations, but I, I will clarify that. And, and to me, that is of distinctive nature to the free trade provisions that you're referring to, but I will clarify it with the, the commissions. Okay. Chair. Oh. Sorry, Chair, I think, well, that's no one, I'm not actually dealing with it in the context of free oh. trade, but I am dealing with it in the context of services. And services in terms of discrimination between men and women if we do have, if we have um, EU law not being applied to here around services, then I, I just think that that could be become a little bit um, of a challenge. But let's let look. Let's get an understanding of it and, yep. and we'll take it from there. Sure. So, Siobhan, you, you you know what you're going to look for there to come back to us. I hope I'm so. I hope yeah. so. <laughs> okay. I know it's right. It, it's not. It's not straightforward. I get. Okay, <laughs> Trevor. I see your hand is up there. If you're looking to. Uh, no, no, Chair, I think that's a leftover from the last session, so apologies to Siobhan, but I enjoyed the presentation, but don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, um, Siobhan and Janet, you'll be pleased to know that was a, a, a quick session. Thank you very much for coming along and giving us that update. Um, we always do appreciate that and the paper that comes with it, and we do have some uh, some information that we'll get from you again then uh, at further today's meeting. So uh, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll let you head on then. Lovely, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, Members, then we will move on uh, to item seven, which is uh, Ray's briefing paper on the executive's international relations and comparisons with Scotland and Wales. Uh, we have Stephen Orme with us here, who is going to uh, give us an introduction and give us an update on that. So, um, Stephen, we'll pass over to yourself then. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll just double check. You can all see and hear me okay, yeah? Indeed, yes, yes. Uh, okay. Um, I know you've had a, a, a lengthy meeting there with your share of technical issues, so I'll, I'll try and keep this as brief as well and then just take any questions. Okay. Um, so this briefing has been produced, as you be aware, kind of as a result of the committee's interest in international relations. I'm aware that the chair visited uh, Washington, D.C. last March and last October, then the, the clerk had requested a paper. Um, and that was provided to the committee then last December. So the briefing looks at Northern Ireland's current international relations setup and considers the approaches of Scotland and Wales as, uh, as our closest comparators in that sense. Um, and the aim was to equip the committee with the current state of play in the area um, in advance of any future policy or strategy development, and then specify any questions arising from the research that the committee might want to consider in that context. 
So as I say, I'll, I'll briefly run over the, the six key points that were arising from the research and then happy to take any questions. So uh, first of all, the executive's most recent international relations strategy was published in 2014 uh, by OFM, DFM, as it was then. Um, there have obviously been major changes in, in global terms and in the, the, the Northern Irish context since then, um, such as the, the UK's exit from the EU, which I know is a focus of the committee's work, uh, 2016 and 17 assembly elections, and the, the shift to an outcomes-based programme for government. Uh, by way of comparison there, Scotland has a current overall international framework, which was published in 2017. Underneath that, it has a number of engagement strategies, which are specific to individual countries. It then, separate to that again, it has a set of overall objectives for its network of international offices, and then specific objectives for each office. Wales then, uh, it launched its current international strategy in early 2020, so early last year. The Welsh network of international offices is appears to be slightly different to those of Scotland or of, of the Northern Ireland Executive, um, but I'll, I'll come on to that shortly. Um, so secondly, in terms of the Scottish and Welsh Parliaments, uh, material that might be of interest to, to the committee, so both the Scottish and Welsh Parliaments recently have undertaken some scrutiny and policy work uh, on international relations. So Welsh Parliament committees in the last few years have published four reports on Wales and future external relations. Uh, UK trade agreements after Brexit, uh, and the Welsh Government's 2020 international relations strategy that I mentioned there. Um, the Scottish Parliament has an ongoing external affairs inquiry, albeit work on that was postponed due to competing pressures from the COVID-19 pandemic since, since early last year. At this stage, that's likely to be resumed at some point after their parliamentary elections in May. Um, so the, the point there is just that international relations um, and, and the environment we're in is, is an area of active concern for the Scottish and Welsh Parliaments as well at the minute. So thirdly then, in doing this research, we, we made some effort to try to compare the international presences of Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Obviously the executive, as the committee will be aware, has the three bureau in Brussels, Washington DC and Beijing. Um, Scotland then has eight offices across the, th the same three areas of the EU, North America and China. The main difference there is Scot the Scottish Government has several offices in specific EU member states like Germany and France. They also have a specific office in, uh, in London within the UK. Wales then, the Welsh Government has 21 offices across 12 countries, so a much higher number, and that is also across a much broader geographic spread than either Scotland or Northern Ireland. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Welsh Government's international office presence is slightly different, and this is where that comes back. So it's not possible really to compare the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish presences on a like-for-like -like basis. Northern Ireland and Scotland, those offices are somewhat comparable in the sense that both of those uh, governments' offices pursue kind of a broad range of diplomatic, economic, cultural and educational priorities. But there's, you know, there's there's quite a bit of contrast between individual offices uh, within Northern Ireland and Scotland. The Welsh offices, meanwhile, as as I mentioned earlier, are different. Um, the overseas offices of the Welsh government are simply the international offices of Trade and Invest Wales, which is the Welsh equivalent of Invest NI, and that means they're primarily focused, not not completely exclusively, but primarily focused on trade alone. Uh, so that brings me to the fourth key point in terms of. The relationship between the bureaus and Invest NI and uh, Northern Ireland's international relations work in general and Invest NI. So, 2014 International Relations Strategy uh, established OFM DFM, now the Executive Office, uh, as the central coordinator of all international work, including that of Invest NI. Invest NI has 22 countries, 22 offices, pardon me, across 16 countries across the across the globe. And that has a, a much broader geographic reach than the three bureaus. Um, it's unclear, however, how and to what extent the work of Invest NI is coordinated with or overseen by the TEO International Relations Team. Uh, as I say, that team, they are the owners of the overall international, international relations strategy, so that relationship should be there. Um, now, to be clear, it's not that there are no links, like for instance, the bureaus and invest in I teams share offices and share office space in Brussels and Beijing. It's more that it's not clear to what extent 
there's a formal relationship there or like explicit direction from the executive office international relations team to the invest ni overseas network in the way that the international relations strategy envisions and then by comparison in wales as i've mentioned the international offices and trade and invest wales offices are one and the same uh, the only limitation to that may be that that may limit the scope or breadth of welsh activity overseas beyond that sort of trade or economic development activity in Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government has central international offices and then the offices of Scottish Development International, which is their Invest NI. Um, the Scottish Government has recently launched uh, five innovation and investment hubs. And basically what they are, are the Scottish Government International Office and the Office of Scottish Development International form the two core partners of, of those hubs. And then uh, any Scottish sort of institutions or actors in those countries, and um, for universities or exporters or importers or any other businesses or institutions, they can subscribe to that hub and make use of the of the facilities and the networks that are available there. Uh, the five Scottish hubs are based in London, Brussels, Berlin, Dublin, and Paris. So London within the UK, and then the other four within the European Union at the minute. Um, I'm also aware that in the church visit to DC last year, representatives of the Scottish and Welsh governments in North America, they both emphasised the value of integrating what you might call the diplomatic or the central international relations work with the trade and economic development work. So to bring that back to the links between Invest NI and international relations more broadly, there may be some value in uh, better or at least more clearly defined um, partnership between the core international relations team and the executive office uh, and invest in eyes overseas network in the future and um, so the the penultimate key point uh, you'll be glad to hear is on well you'll be glad to hear it's the penultimate point is on brexit and um, so i don't mean to break any new ground uh, on brexit and i know as i say it's a focus of work for the committee but the the point in the paper essentially is the uk's exit from the eu has and will continue to kind of significantly change Northern Ireland's relationship with the EU and, and status with it. Uh, and in addition to that, the protocol for as long as it continues in force will require a close and ongoing NIEU relationship of, of whatever form that takes. In that context, it's, it's noteworthy in a comparative sense that both the Scottish and Welsh governments, who you could argue would be slightly more distant from the EU than, than even Northern Ireland, they have both recently reaffirmed their commitment to an ongoing physical presence in Brussels. And as I say, Scotland House in Brussels, it's one of the five innovation and investment hubs that I've just detailed. Um, so the point in Brexit is very short, but just given both the general impacts of Brexit and the specific and you know quite unique requirements of the protocol, there's probably value in considering the best approach and presence for Northern Ireland at the EU um, in that new context. And so the final point then, the, the last point the briefing looked at was the potential structures for any new or updated international relations strategy. Um, our current international relations strategy is from the, uh, the previous the previous executive from the 2011 to 2015 assembly mandate. In terms of current management and monitoring, I know in a previous paper to the committee uh, about a year ago, the research service had advised that there are very few publicly available targets or specific actions for each bureau at the minute. For what it's worth, that is the case in Scotland and Wales as well. Um, in fact, in Wales, the Welsh Government's international strategy when it was launched early last year, uh, it came in for criticism specifically for being very light on measurable indicators and targets. Within the executive, the most recent sort of systematic and public reporting on international relations and bureau activity is within the most recent reports on the outcomes delivery plan, uh, which is what, what the civil service used um, to keep the program for government ticking over over the last few years. And those reports, they briefly report on kind of the major activity and achievements <laughs> in international relations. So like the, the head of the civil service leading a delegation to a UK China leaders summit, uh, the Brussels Bureau hosting cultural events, and then the core staff maybe hosting inward visits or outward visits for senior officials to meet ambassadors or elected representatives or think tank members, things like that. So it's clear based on the sort of information that's available that, you know, the work is going on. The main open question in terms of future policy and strategy is how best to capture that work and its impact. 
So in the event of any new strategy, as I say, um, it's obviously relevant that the executive remains committed to an outcomes-based program for government and currently has the outcomes framework open for consultation that the committee will be aware of again. Um, the specific merits and challenges of outcomes-based accountability of, of OBA uh, will quite literally most likely be another briefing. Um, but I could safely say that any new or updated international strategy could possibly fit very well into the performance accountability level of OBA. Um, and without going into what that is in too much detail, um, what that could look like in practice is the executive office's international relations team and the three bureau developing uh, what are called performance measures, potentially in conjunction with the committee or with the committee's input, and then reporting on them. Uh, typically, that will be quarterly to answer the three questions of that level of OBA. And those are how much did we do, how well did we do it, and is anyone better off? And with those questions aimed to capture are the quantity of the work that was done, the quality of that work, and then the most importantly, the impacts or the end results of that work. And so that sort of approach, that will be consistent with the approach of the programme for government, most, most importantly and centrally. And it could also be the basis for potentially more clear and more robust links with the Invest NI overseas network, should they be taking a similar approach in line with the pro programme for government structure. Um, to follow on from a precedent set in Wales, those sorts of quarterly reports could also be provided to the committee um, to assist with scrutiny or further policy or operational development. Um, so those are the key findings from the research. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, as I say. So that's Okay. Me. Stephen, thank you very much for that. That's been a very useful report. And um, I maybe don't have so much a, a question really as a comment that, you know, um, part of the, the the reason and the thread behind this was during the visit last year um, actually encountering the service and seeing what it was doing but also maybe seeing the level of work that the unit was doing um, but maybe not seeing the huge benefit of that being, being reflected back to us to see, hear and know what's happening and, and that only um, grows with me whenever I see that Invest and I have 22 offices overseas you know, because I don't think we're seeing new investment in twenty from twenty two different countries, or, or that we're seeing a massive influx of connections between, uh, the, you know, twenty two countries and here. Uh, and and I suppose uh, it makes me think as well that you know international relations is is much more than just um, trade. That there is much more that you could actually be um, pushing out and portraying about the North that actually could be of benefit to trade, but also developing those cultural and tourism and other uh, links. Uh, and as I say, uh, I saw the operation that there was uh, in, from the, the, the Welsh office and from the Scottish office, and and felt like uh, it just it was up a gear um, in terms of of sort of just beyond trade as was our office there in fairness. But so it's just sort of seeing it as, as a big resource and just thinking, how can we maximize that resource uh, and ensure that we get the best delivery from it? Um, and, and also, I think that the fact that we don't have a sort of really up-to-date uh, plan uh, and maybe we need to sort of press for some sort of international relations strategy that does reflect a more up-to-date view of where we are uh, and what we can maximise out of them. Um, and I'll maybe suggest as well that we should maybe write to the Economy Committee and ask them just, are, are, I suppose, are they aware that there, there are 22 overseas offices, but are they getting, do they get a sense that they're getting an understanding as a committee of the work that's actually going on uh, in, in there? Because that, that's a big, big resource. And, and I, I, I would love to be proved that there's a massive return uh, on that. So uh, if there isn't, then it's maybe about the best way to shape that for the future. I'm going to pass to Doug, maybe if you have any comments on that or questions. Colin, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I don't again. But, but just to follow on from what you said, I think you're absolutely right. 22 offices, what is the output? What are we getting from this? I think that's really important. And I think, Stephen, if there's any way of quantifying, you know, what, what is the output from our 22 offices compared to the output of Wales or compared to the output of Scotland? You know, if I was to look for a table, you know, and say, well, this is the output of, of Wales's um, 
uh, offices. This is the output of, of Scotland and this is the output of Northern Ireland. So, you know, to make it comparable, is that possible to be able to get something like that, as simplistic as it, it might sound? Um, I couldn't give you a categorical answer either way at the minute. I imagine this might be something that I email the economy researcher about. But um, I think it, both with international relations, uh, as, as I say, as the focus of this paper, and then with, with the overseas economic development as well, something that um, that the the uh, certainly that the, the international offices in other countries have often fall back on would be to say that there is an extent to which it's 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 legitimate as well is um, a lot of the the outcomes are quite grey and long term and it's hard to be definitive as to you know who was solely responsible or who made the decisive action and um, so I don't know in terms of the precise comparability of you could do the, the exact thing for Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, but we can we can look into it anyway. Yeah, and, and I get that, um, Stephen. So, and, and 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 I wasn't going to put you on the spot, but I guess it's you know even if you look at and, and, I, and this is basic stuff, um, you know, very simplistic. But even if you look at tourism, you know, if we've got an office somewhere, has our tourism increased from that country to Northern Ireland? You know, are we selling ourselves in in that country? It's, it's that sort of thing as well. And and our educational links have our educational links between that country improved in any way? Even if it is, you know, if it's a non English speaking country, are we importing? people to teach English in their in their universities, that, that kind of thing. It would just be really interesting to sort of try and measure some of this. But I thought that was, that was fascinating. Thank you. Well, that is, I can just pick up on, if, if it's all right, if I can just pick up on yes. that Doug was making. Um, in, terms of, in terms of, you know, the, the outcomes or the impacts of, of uh, presences in particular countries, um, that is the sort of stuff that a, a well-designed sort of OBA report card is, is the, 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 the term for it. But... Um, if if that approach was adopted uh, by by as I say you know the the core bureau or the core international relations work and you know theoretically that that should be the approach for the invest and I overseas network as an agency of the executive as well or of a department that is the sort of measure you could have in the what impact did we have sort of quadrant you know the number of increased uh, tourists from a particular country to the extent that's measurable or the number of increased tourists um, overall. And that is that is the sort of thing that you could potentially capture at the performance level of OBA. And as I say, there, you know, we'll, we'll I'm sure we'll be back talking about OBA again. But um, the other point I would just make in relation to the points you're making is this is probably the best time. I mean, I I'm not aware when the executive is uh, planning on bringing forward any updated or, or refreshed international strategy. But you know, uh, your uh, the committee might be best place to influence it, you know, at the as high up the stream as possible, if you know what I mean. And uh, so, you know, if you've got particular uh, ideas for what you would like to see in the strategy or the, the approach of the strategy or how best to use, if, if outcomes-based accountability is to be the approach, how best to utilize that uh, and what you want in there, it's obviously, you know, with, um, the committee will be aware, but uh, the earliest stage possible will always yield the most or give you, give you the opportunity to, to get the most. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just looking around, uh, Martina, your hand still up there. Do you want to come in? Yeah. Um, can I can I thank you, Stephen, for for the information and in that presentation? And I have to say, in Fest and I, um, I thought I knew it all. You know, but listening to you today, twenty two offices in sixteen countries. I can tell you from Derry, from the point of view in Derry in the northwest. You know their um, their performance is an abject failure. Only recently, I got um, a response to a question from the economy minister, who told me over a period of time there are twenty nine jobs created in Derry compared to one thousand two hundred of the same period in Belfast. So I do think there needs to be a connective uh, link between the trade and what's going on in terms of international relations. Because Invest and I, for many, many years, have had that kind of abject failure from the Northwest and Derry point of view. And yet, I can tell you that the people of Derry would, um, would just scratch their head to know that this outfit has been operating in 22 offices in 16 countries. And the kind of delivery or non-delivery for the Northwest has been evident for years. 
So I think given that the executive in New Decade New Approach has to deliver on economic growth inclusively uh, based on objective need, um, I do think there's a job of work for this committee and maybe it is through the international relationship and trade that we perhaps could get Invest NI to deliver more for more areas across the north as opposed to for one area in terms of when you look at the stats, there seems to be a lot of investment and job creation going into South Belfast. And obviously that's where they're located, but I'm sure it's not as lazy as just because there's an office there in South Belfast. Like we have got a sub-regional office uh, here in Derry for what, you know, for what benefit it does us. Um, and so far as the people in it are very good workers uh, without doubt, but in terms of investment and job, uh, it doesn't have a return. So like Doug, I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit surprised to hear that. And I do think that there's a job of work for this committee in relation to trying to tie that up. And I want Stephen to thank you for bringing that information to us today. And Sherry, do you think we need to put it in the agenda for a more dedicated conversation? And let's see if we can get a strategy and an approach that's going to have Invest NI deliver for the people of the North in the way that they're supposed to. Okay, th thank you for that, Martina. And, and certainly there are more overseas offices than there has ever been inward investment visits to South Down. So I share your pain there. I think over the period of a, I think it was a five-year period, we had about two or three visits, but yet there were some constituencies that had very generous attendances. But yeah, it's a, it's a point well made. And I think this is something that we will get the opportunity to maybe to drill down into. Trevor, is your hand still up from the last time, or you? Yeah, uh, I haven't put my hand up in an hour. Yeah, <laughs> it has to be very sore. Maybe it's the one that you got the injection in. It's the kind of uh, uh -huh. it's gone numb on you. You don't realise that it's still up there. So it is. But okay, that's that's Not fine. Stephen, nobody else is indicating there to, to come in. Can I thank you for that? I say I think it's been very illuminating for us on a couple of fronts, and and certainly I think it will be our intention to do some further follow up to that work. So thank you very much for coming along today to present that and for the work for the report as well. So thank you. Thank you. And maybe uh, members, maybe uh, on the back of that, can I recommend that we maybe write to the department and ask? Maybe just about the international strategy and the, what, what, where it currently is and, and any plans to update it. And maybe about how we measure the outcomes of the international work. And, and that could go maybe in twofold within those bureaus that we have, but also within the work that's carried out by Invest NI. And then maybe if we do drop that note to the um, economy committee and, and just ask them is that something that they're aware of and do they monitor and and do they keep check on it but um i, I do feel like we've maybe stumbled across something there that that, that is worth uh, pursuing and, and whether it's ourselves or the economy department but certainly i think we need to know you know how many staff are in those various offices how much are they being paid how, how do you measure their success in terms of attracting that investment back in uh, to Northern Ireland? And how many lines can be drawn between the work of those individuals and the actual delivery of jobs and investments here in the North? So um, I think there's a, a, a lot of information. And if we send those letters off, if we review them when they come back, we'll maybe decide what we could do next then. Would that be, is there anything any member would like to add to any of that? Okay, that's oh yeah. Go ahead, Martina. Oh wait, you switched yourself on me up there. Sorry, Chair. I do think there is an opportunity in terms of international relationship and invest in. I sometimes I felt they have operated nearly on a silo, out on their own, and this could be uh, an opportunity for collaborative working, so that we don't have, for instance, as you are talking about the kind of um, investor visits to your area or any area. That that's not the outcomes that uh, that is acceptable to any MLA. I find that is equally as offensive as happening in your area as I find it in my own area in terms of the the number of investors uh, visits to the area. It's very very low. Uh, and like you said, there are more offices than what there are investors visits. So wherever it is across the board in the north and um, the millions of pounds that invest in i get then we do need to get seek outcomes and here's an opportunity i think for more you know collaborative work between uh, the the economy department as well as the executive office okay michael are you happy enough with what's captured there for for going forward yep okay
All right, members, look, um, we'll move on then from that. We're, uh, if we're happy, we'll, we'll progress to item eight, which is the forward work program. It's on page 193 of the meeting pack. Um, maybe just to highlight, members, the uh, we had agreed that the junior ministers would brief the committee on a monthly basis, but the proposed date for March actually has fallen when we're in recess. Now, we're, uh, the two options, I suppose, is would you like to uh, have the meeting out in recess? Or the first meeting that we have back after the recess is the first and deputy first minister um, visiting us. Now, if we bring them forward, we're going to have to juggle because we have a, a full timetable. So I suppose maybe my suggestion is do we maybe want to forgo that visit at the that, that scheduled the recess? Yet, and then we would just hold any questions that we would have asked of the juniors uh, just to the, the week or two weeks later, whenever we have the first and deputy first minister, would that work for people okay? Yeah, Chair, I think, I mean, I'll see you let Pat sort of speak for ourselves in terms of it working for us. Um, I do think we just need to keep a wee, you know, a wee eye on the grace period um, because the 1st of April, the first, you know, three months of that grace period ends. So I know people will be, you know, reluctant in terms of the recess or whatever, because it's not that any of us go into recess. We still still be working in our own constituencies. Um, but I just flagging that up. Um, it may be a, that the conversation then with the the ministers, the joint first ministers, is okay for that time. But I'm just flagging up the first technical date for the grace period to end if there's not an extension and who knows we're all supporting the need maybe for some flexibility around this but if there's not uh it will be at that time and if there's not the proper preparation taking place yeah. that could be problematic for people pat do you want to come in on that no, I have nothing really more to add to that, Colin. I mean, I think uh, Martina has summed it up well. Okay. Well, look, could I make a suggestion then if this works? Um, if they were due to come into us on the Wednesday uh, as much, yes, recess, but obviously I'm very conscious that staff are on recess and, and other people, buildings aren't open or if we're still online or whatever, that, that communication people might be on recess or breaks as well. But could I suggest that if we brought it forward to the week before recess, maybe try and secure a date and time from the junior ministers that would suit them in that week and just have an extra one hour, 90 minute meeting with just the one single agenda item of the, the, the junior ministers. And if we felt one week or two weeks before, we really don't need this, we kind of then we could politely cancel that request with the junior ministers. But if we have it in the diary, and then we feel we need it, then we can do it. But rather than stacking uh, 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 an agenda, which are really, as you can see today, you know, and we have two very light items on afterwards, we're, we're, we're swollen to nearly two hours, 40 minutes. So rather than doing that, we could set it for another stage in that week. Would that work for people? Okay, Michael, can you maybe see with the junior ministers then if we could get a, you know, like a Friday morning or a um, Thursday afternoon or, or, or something meeting with them then? Okay. Can I ask you, Chair, just in line with that, I know you already said it at the committee and there was nobody objected, but just in line with that, because of the time frame we're working under, could you think of trying to draft something between the two committee chairs? Um, I know the other chair didn't actually yep. get into attendance today, particularly about reaching out to, wow. um, to the EU Commission and the Parliament, because they, they're dealing with all these issues and they need to hear our voice, and that includes the views that are being expressed by Doug. I, I took that as a, actually an action from the meeting that we would be pursuing that. So, yeah, I'm comfortable with that if others are. Yeah. Okay, members, um, then uh, if we want to content to note the rest of the forward work program. Okay. And then item nine is correspondence. There are, uh, the correspondence is in the pack. Uh, is there any issue that a member would wish to raise? Okay, so then we're happy to note all of the correspondence that's in there. Okay, well then that brings us to item 10. Any other business? Is there anything that any member wants to raise? Chair, could I just ask a question? Um, yes. I think it was three weeks ago, I suggested that we might get confirmation from the various bodies who ran the mother and baby homes and so on about their insurance or otherwise. And we we're going to write to the department, I think, and ask them to confirm. Did, did we ever get a reply or did we write? <laughs> 
we, 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 we did write, uh, but we haven't received uh, back yet. So we, we, we're waiting for the reply to that letter. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, uh, folks, we move on to item 11. Date, time, and place of next meeting is Wednesday, the 17th of February at 2 p.m. in your house. So, wherever. <laughs> wherever that is for people so look thank you very much for bearing with us today and um have a good week and we'll see you next week okay thank you thank, thank you, you.